boy, those Johto videos really blew up. First off, thank you. I don't deserve it and don't know what I'm doing. Uh, the videos uh, were pretty much made for my own personal enjoyment and the enjoyment of a few friends, but uh, to address some stuff I feel like I missed out on talking about Johto as a world some, but I'm going to tie that into the can of discussion some because the Japanese ties to the real world are interesting, and um, also it's my video so I can just do that. Secondly, I know I made some mistakes. I really do. <laughs> I'll do my best, but there will be some here somewhere. I've had a lot of them pointed out. I know. I know that I got water absorbed wrong. I'm very sorry. Uh, I'm stupid after all. Lastly, since these Pokemon videos will be semi-regular, if slow, I'm not gonna touch stuff that's not available in the game. It obviously doesn't apply to the first generation, but uh, one of the things I regret the most in the Heart Gold Soul Silver video especially was talking about a bunch of irrelevant Pokemon. Uh, yeah. Beyond that, I appreciate the support and the hate, the toleration for my awful, awful narration. Patience in waiting for this, and hopefully your enjoyment of whatever this turns out to be. I'll try to be less messy in the gameplay section especially. I know that part was very long, and also uh, consider this video part two of sorts in that if I don't explain something, I probably already did in the GSC or HGSS videos. With all that out of the way, Pokemon Red and Blue, 1998, Game Boy, the introduction of the world of Pokemon, and down the road, got a nice reintroduction on the 3DS Virtual Console with support for transferring Pokemon into the modern game, specifically Sun and Moon. Red and Blue are a bit odd, they are a look into the childhood of their director more than anything. Satoshi Tajiri has said things along the lines of this game's world, Kanto being based on places he could bike to as a kid, tied into his love of bug catching in obvious ways, and among other things. The development of the games was never easy, they went through a ton of iterations before landing on what they became, although many of these revisions are long lost to time. But in the end, they had a weird magnetic resonance, combined with an aggressive campaign of advertisements via cards, toys, the anime, and began Pokemania, the peak of the series popularity-wise and the beginning of this messy, messy franchise. I said I don't want to over-discuss gameplay, and I won't, promise, but the gameplay in Red and Blue is too weird not to. I'm gonna leave most of it alone, it's largely the same as in Gold and Silver, um, alright. Overworld is more limited. There's only one Pokemon in the game as a surf encounter and no headbutt, so you just got grass caves and fishing for the most part. Battles still work mostly the same, but there's a lot of quirks that I kinda have to talk about, as well as far fewer moves, which limits some types heavily, and no weather or abilities, obviously, and the bag size limit is even smaller and worse, with no pockets to keep it organized, so you constantly need to store key items you no longer need in the PC because this game is barely held together, and the bag lacks the quick select option. Anytime you want to hop on your bike, you're menuing, which is obnoxious. Now let's talk about what's actually different in battles. First few notes on the type chart, which is not as well balanced as Gen 2 made it. Seal and Dark don't exist at all in this generation, which only affects Magnemite and Magneton, who lack the seal typing. This also means the types that interacted with those are missing their interactions. For other types, Fire lacked its resistance size, which means very little besides Charizard and Moltres are marginally worse, but also it brings up an interesting quirk of how the special properties of types work. Like in later generations, Fire is immune to getting burned, although this kind of has an asterisk in red and blue as some weird shortcut, Pokemon are only granted their status immunity if the move matches their type. Fire types can't be burned by fire moves, but a non-fire move that applies burn would still burn them. Largely, this is pretty minor, only a few moves fall in this category, but it is kind of good to know. Status in Gen 1 also has a few odd quirks, and I'll talk about the statuses as I hit their types. To start with burn, it's far weaker in this generation. It maintains the attack having effect, but it only deals 1 16th HP per turn, as opposed to 1 8th. There's also some quirks that affect it in odd ways. Its damage is dealt immediately after an afflicted Pokemon makes a move, as opposed to at the end of a turn. Knocking an opponent out immediately ends turns in this game, skipping effects that would otherwise take place after, meaning knocking out a Pokemon while burned will cause you to skip taking damage. This also intentionally or not applies to, of all things, Hyper Beam's recharge turn, which makes that move extremely deadly, and lastly, there's the Toxic Counter Bug, which can cause burn to be far more lethal, but I'll return to that when I get to the Poison type. While the Grass type is unchanged, Leech Seed, which doesn't work against Grass types like in Generation 2, is also affected by the Toxic Glitch. The Poison types in these games is strong offensively against Bug types. I assume they nerfed this later because the Bug type is terrible, but Poison was also weak to Bug, giving both of these fairly bad types something at least. Like with Burn, Poison is much weaker in this game, doing 1 16th damage a turn, but with no added benefit. While Toxic is a bit more interesting, working exactly as it does in later generations, but with weird properties related to its turn counter. If stacked with Leech Seed, or if a Pokemon with Toxic cures it with Rest and then gets Seeded Burned or regular Poisoned, these moves will also increase in power with the turn counter. Stack seeds will continue to raise in power, healing more and more each turn, and knocking out the opponent twice as fast, while otherwise the moves will increase the counter, but get the massive power increase afforded by it, making for interesting strategies around it regardless. 
The electric type is able to be paralyzed by anything that causes paralysis without being a damaging electric move, thunder wave, or body slam basically, while well, normal types are immune to paralysis from body slam but nothing else. And paralysis also works differently, which was also the case in later gens until 6, but it's still worth noting here. Psychic is the most dramatically different type in the game, basically being downright broken. Not only due to its type chart, nor the usual great coverage, but how some stats work, which I'll get to in a second. In this game, psychic types really have no weaknesses, no good weaknesses anyway. Not only on account of the lack of dark type, but for whatever ungodly reason because it's immune to ghost moves. Granted, there are barely any ghost moves to begin with, and the only ghosts are half poison and therefore weak to psychic, leaving only a bug weakness, which beyond being a dreadful type only has a handful of damaging moves. The incredibly weak 20 base power leech life, which is available on 6 Pokemon, 4 of which are part poison. Pin Missile, a 14 base power move that can hit up to 5 times, which is available on 2 Pokemon, one of which isn't a bug, so no same type attack bonus, and the other of which is part poison, so it's weak to psychic. And Twin Needle, a 20 base power move that hits twice and is available on a singular part poison in Pokemon. This leads to anything that's at least half Psychic being very, very good. Not less because they have access to the incredible move Psychic. Ice is not resisted by fire, giving it a touch more versatility, although it's still generally a pretty bad type defensively. The same can't be said for the free status condition, which is entirely horrifically broken. Frozen Pokemon will never dethaw unless hit by a fire move that has a burn chance, and unlike later generations, they can't use their own fire moves to thaw themselves. In Ice Heals used, or if the opponent uses Haze, leaving your fate up to either having an item to save yourself or your opponent for some reason rescuing you from your fate, which is probably not gonna happen. Happen. Freezing is effectively a one-hit KO in this game. Bug is a bit stronger hypothetically, as it hits super effective against poison as opposed to being resisted by it, although it also takes double damage from poison itself, as opposed to neutrality, more or less balancing it out. Ghost is basically a junk type. It's only strong against itself, while Psychic is immune to it. It also has the downside of being affected by a choice few normal and fighting moves that either work as counters or deal fixed damage. Bide, Counter, Seismic Toss, Sonic Boom, and Super Fang. Any type I didn't specifically mention here is otherwise only different through its interaction with types that don't exist yet, Steel and Dark. TMs are also worth mentioning here, in that even compared to the generation after this, they're a headache. Most Pokemon have very slim level up movesets in this game, and even the most usable Pokemon are fairly reliant on single use TMs. Not to mention, in Gen 2 and beyond, where breeding is a thing, you can at least potentially breed TM moves onto things if you regret burning one, but here, if you're not planning well ahead, you're going to want to be really cautious with TMs, as a lot of Pokemon border on unusable without them, or you're going to be sunk costing into an absolute shitmon. Now for stats and the weirdness associated with them. The one most people will immediately think of is the special stat, the singular special stat. Special attack and special defense are calculated using the same stats. Let that soak in a little bit. The developers split the physical stats, but not the special stats. This quite frankly makes anything that was designed to be a special attacker or defender, uh, such as Mewtwo or Chansey, into insane monsters who shit damage and completely wall out any other special damage. It's not a surprise why special attackers are so highly valued in this game. Depending on the Pokemon, in later generations, they would keep their overall special stat in this game as either attack or defense, while the other would usually be much more reasonable, although there are some exceptions. Speed is another stat that works very differently, primarily in that speed determines critical hit chance. Faster Pokemon crit more. On the highest end, with Electrode, the crit rate reaches just over 27%, while slow Pokemon like Lickitung, Slowbro, Snorlax, and Parasect have a measurable 5%. This is also before taking into account moves that have increased critical hit ratio like Slash, which causes a Pokemon with anything at or above 64 base speed, which starts at the already slow Flareon, Vaporeon, and Sand Slash, to always crit, making these moves double damage factories, and even on slower Pokemon like Parasect, bump them up to nearly 50% crit chances. However, crits aren't always a good thing. Crits in these games ignore all stat boosts, positive and negative. This is great when going against an opponent that's trying to boost their defense, or in a scenario where your own stats are being decreased, but means that boosting on a fast Pokemon is pretty impractical, as crits will always deal double damage, which is far below the 4 times maximum of fully setting up with Sword Stance. There's also a further weirder caveat to consider. Focus Energy, more specifically how it's broken and how that helps boosters, as instead of boosting crit rate by 4 times as it was intended to, it divides it by 4, putting something like Electrode in a much more reasonable 7%, giving it at least some ability to use boosting strategies. Is this practical? Not really. You're already spending a bunch of turns setting up, and wasting a move slot and an extra turn to lower your own crit rate as a questionable move set, when just going all out on crits is likely better. It's just kinda interesting to consider the boosting potential of slow Pokemon over fast ones. It also feels right to touch on the badge boost skill cheer as it kinda comes into play a lot. With certain badges, you're granted a permanent 12.5% boost to a stat, 
Brock raises attack, Koga raises special, and so on. It's meant to help you feel like you're progressing, and it's a fine bonus. The issue is that every time your stats change, positive or negative, these boosts are mistakenly reapplied. Boosts your own attack with Sword Stance, and you also get faster and take more hits because of raised defense. Get hit with Growl, that's a special increase. This makes boosting strategies even better than they should be, even with the risk of crits fucking things up, as every stat changing move becomes an Omni Boost. Uh, I'm adding this section kinda late just to add some more interesting stuff. Pokemon in Gen 1 can technically be shiny despite them not existing yet, as DVs determine shininess in Gen 2. If the DVs line up in a way that determines shininess, you can transfer it into Generation 2 and it will become shiny, a feature maintained for transferring them to Gen 7 on the Virtual Console, although only certain Pokemon can be shiny. Pokemon encountered by walking, either in the grass or in dungeon, or by surfing can never be shiny, meaning it's limited to the fairly broad set of Pokemon available as overworld interactable encounters, which are the legendary Snorlax and Electrode, gifts including the starters in the Game Corner prize, in-game trades, and fishing at the standard Gen 2 rate of 1 in 8192. Catching is also pretty jank, nothing really works properly, Ultra Balls are a bad investment as Great Balls are almost always better, and low-level Pokémon have higher catch rates in Pokéballs than Ultra Balls due to all the wonkiness. Uh, I'm not gonna go into it all, there's a video that I'll link somewhere that goes into it. It's not greatly impactful, but it's kind of interesting. Also the PC sucks in Gen 1, it's even slower and clunkier than Gen 2. It lacks any images that would have made it look nicer, it's just plain white menus, and it lacks the move function at all, making it very tedious to sort boxes and then you have to withdraw everything and then manually redeposit in the order you want them. It's, it's not pleasant. Lastly, you can't escape Gen 1 without talking about glitches. I've already talked about some, but man, this game is really, really struggling to stay together. They're the best and worst parts of these games, endlessly interesting. Hell, you can warp to the credits in less than two minutes, and I guess these glitches give it a ton of flavor, but also they're kind of endless and obnoxious when you're not trying to mess with them. I'm not going to cover everything, there's way, way too much. I'm just going to hit some of the interesting highlights in quick succession. First, all moves have a 1 in 256 chance of missing at any time, thanks to using a less than symbol and accuracy calculation instead of a less than or equal to symbol. The miss chance is so low that you can't really fret about it, but it's hilarious when it happens against you and frustrating when it happens to you, although if you're in a position that a miss like that caused you to lose, you probably would have lost anyway. If you level up beyond what you would to learn a move, say gaining two levels when you would gain a move on the first level up, you'll never be given the prompt to learn that move which severely punishes fast grinding. Binding moves like Rap and Fire Spin prevent your opponent from taking any action, hitting over and over again until their timer ends. This isn't a glitch, it's just a bad decision, and can make these moves really overpowered. Also, with these and any other multi-hit move, if the first hit is a crit, every subsequent hit also will be. In every gym, you can fish in the statue on the left. In most gyms, you can only get Magikarp with the old rod, but in Cerulean, there's a whole set of things to catch. Struggle, the move you use if you run out of moves to use, is normal type instead of typeless, meaning it can't hit ghosts. Uh, so if you end up in a situation against a ghost where you're stuck struggling, you've lost. Sleep lasts up to seven turns. This isn't a glitch, it's just fucked up. You can evolve any Pokémon that evolves by a stone by leveling up against certain Pokémon that correlate their index numbers with evolution stones. If a Pokémon that evolves by Moonstone levels up against an Executor, it'll evolve. Firestone is missing number, which means you have to use glitches to get it. Thunderstone is Growlithe, Waterstone is Onix, and Leafstone is Psyduck. Evolution stones are infinitely repeatable and very cheap, so this is kind of just a goofy thing. The Celadon Hotel, a superfluous area in the city, has an invisible PC. It can be used like a normal PC, but it's invisible. It's put there because the hotel used the Pokemon Center as a base. Lastly, there's the Mew glitch, and it's a lot to get into. But here's a short explanation. When spotted by a trainer, there's a brief window where you can still pause the game, depending on where you are in relation to them. If you fly away in this window, something about the trainer ID messes up where the game thinks you are. By fighting a different trainer, you really give the game a good scramble and can then go on to encounter basically anything, depending on what trainers you interacted with and what Pokémon you last defeated. Most famously, the event exclusive Mew, but also a slew of non-existent glitch Pokémon, of which there are a solid 50 or so, most famously Missing Number, who either appeared as a scrambled block, the fossils of the fossil Pokémon, or the Ghost Sprite, loving a bunch of random moves, and the Bird type, which served as the predecessor to the Flying type before being replaced. Largely, these glitch Pokémon are scrambled sprites with nonsense names of jumbled numbers, letters, and graphics, move lists consisting of random moves, and they tend to eventually evolve into regular Pokémon, but they also tend to crash the game. You could probably drag one through the entire game if you really wanted, but it would probably be a pretty miserable experience. I really won't be discussing them further, as I have no idea how I could, but they are an interesting aspect of the game to monkey with. 
As it goes, red and blue are almost certainly the most similar of any pair in the series. Gold and silver are pretty close, but it does change what order you get the legendaries in. In red and blue, the only changes are the exclusive pairs, most of which replace each other on routes. A few Pokemon change how common they are too, but beyond the very early game, this matters extremely little. Pairs of exclusives tend to have a common theme, which is a nice detail that began here. Each game has 11 exclusive Pokemon, split between 6 evolutionary families. Red gets Ekans and Arbok, while blue gets Sandshrew and Sandslash. Snakes eat moles, but Sandshrew's ground typing beats out Ekans' poison, which is a really creative way to pair them up. Each game gets its own grass poison type line, red gets Oddish Gloom and Vileplume, while blue gets Bell's Fire Weeping Bell and Victory Bell. The similarities run deep, down to both reaching their final stage by Leaf Stone, although the Bell Sprout line leans fast offensive, while Oddish's is slower and mixed. In perhaps the oddest pairing, Red gets Mankey and Primeape, while Blue gets Meowth and Persian. Both evolve at 28, and Mankey's fighting type beats Meowth's normal, but they seem to have little else in common. Each game also gets its own fire type two stage line that evolves by Firestone, Red getting Growlithe and Arcanine, Blue getting Vulpix and Ninetales. Arcanine is all around the stronger of the two, but its physical lean means it's kind of limited in options, while Ninetale leans more strongly into the special stat, letting it use good fire moves more solidly. Scyther's in red and Pinsir's in blue, they're both bugs found in the Safari Zone, although Scyther is also part flying, neither evolves, and they both lack bug moves despite their typing, although so does every other bug. Finally, red gets Electabuzz and blue gets Magmar. These two are kinda odd counterparts. They share gender ratios in the later games, get pre-evolutions and evolutions together, and are generally paired together beyond both being based on Japanese myths. Jinx arguably is also part of a trio of these Yokaimon, although it mostly got dropped over the controversy before getting its own evolution. As for my preference, um, both are good. I love Sandslash, I love Scyther, I love Magmar, and Electabuzz. I'm split pretty evenly and fairly neutral on most of the Pokemon split up. Blue's power level is probably a bit higher, Persian is really fast and crits a lot, and Victory Bell is definitely stronger than Vileplume. But even then, Magmar isn't available until very late, while Red can get the decently good Electabuzz in the mid-game. I lean blue, but it's a pretty minor difference. Some other minor notes. Enemy Pokemon don't have power points, they can continue acting indefinitely. This rarely matters, but can cause at least one very tedious soft soft lock, and forces you to play pretty aggressively. Field moves also don't have contact sensitivity. In every generation after this one, you can press A on a cut tree to be prompted to cut it, or A on water to surf. In this game, you need to manage these options every time. It's a minor bit of tedium, but the game never asks you to do it so frequently that it's miserable, just a missing quality of life thing that the rest of the series has. Okay, we're past the gameplay stuff. I, I told you I'd keep it short, or shorter. Graphically, I'm not breaking new ground here. This game looks pretty bad in a lot of ways. <laughs> Maybe that's unfair. The overworld is fine, but on Game Boy it's black and white without a lot of color, and the palettes and character sprites are pretty limited. On the Super Game Boy, the game has simple palettes in the overworld, with each town having a color matching its name, which is cute, while giving each Pokemon its own simple palette in battles, which helps some, but goddamn the battle sprites are <laughs> pretty bad. They're not technically off-model since the sprites came before the Sugimori arts, although a lot of them are pretty janky. Jigglypuff's uneven eyes, whatever's going on with Mankey, 2D Charmeleon and Barney Charizard, Obese Blastoise, Drug Addict Golbat, Waxy Golem. There's some admittedly really good ones too. Gengar and Haunter look really slick, especially in color with the purple glow on dark black bodies. Nidoking looks really powerful, Clefable. But these are exceptions, not the rule, not by a long shot. And somehow the back sprites are just all terrible. I don't think there's a single good back sprite in the mix. Thankfully on the musical end of things, it's a really strong start. Much of the music in this game is pretty tired by now. But that's just because it's so good that they kept remixing and incorporating it, whether it's a chill town theme, the strong theme for the early routes that feel like you're striking out on an adventure, the hype battle themes, or even the weirder stuff like Lavender Town's unique melancholy track. The music manages to be all over the place in tone, but while maintaining that adventurous spirit, and somehow pushing through the limitations of what the Game Boy was capable of musically, given its usually shrill beeping. My biggest complaint is that there isn't a whole lot of music. Between 23 routes, there's only 4 or 5 route themes, and the towns often share their themes with at least one other. That said, that's a limitations issue, and everything here is really great in spite of the console. Before I move on, a defense of Kanto. I actually don't love Kanto, I think in a lot of ways it's pretty dull, uniform, and samey. The caves are mostly awful, the routes tend to be walls of trainers with small patches of grass off to one side or the other, but it's also an interesting look into Tajiri's childhood. Pellet Town is his hometown, renamed to fit in with the color theme names of the other towns. Obviously it's the starting point of colors and painting, but everywhere else is places he went and saw and explored as a kid. The color theming is also cute in that the towns are named to hint at what each town is about. Pewter is gray and home to the museum and rock type gyms, Cerulean is blue for the waters 
colors there. Even lavender is a pale purple for its ghosts, with each town except saffron a golden color, perhaps to show the opulence of Tokyo, and Viridian, which is probably green due to the forest it shares its name with, matching this theming. On Super Game Boy, the palettes for each town even change to match the colors of their namesakes, which is really cute. Perhaps this doesn't fully excuse some kind of boring design at times, but it gives it an interesting excuse for being that way, because it's real. Unlike other regions, Kanto is directly named for the real-life Japanese region it's based on, even down to the map being a rough approximation of the region. Kanto is most famous for housing Tokyo, which is largely represented by Saffron and Seldon cities, which are centered in the map, and as it spirals back out to Palette, you slowly get more and more rural. Kanto is also very modern, to 1996 anyway, because for all intents and purposes, it's our real world. You have modern cities, slightly advanced beyond our own with teleporters and a free healthcare, but it's still a time capsule to Japan at that time. I also think Johto is a nice reflection of that, and yeah, I'm making up for not doing this in the last video, but uh, Johto is also based on Kanto's real world neighbor, Kansai. It obviously abandons the naming, I assume they wanted to have a bit more freedom in fictionalizing. Although like Kanto, Johto closely matches the geography of its inspiration. Hell Mount Silver between the two is pretty much just Mount Fuji. Johto, as well as to an extent Kansai, are much simpler than the bustle of Tokyo and Kanto. The brilliance of Johto as a companion is in its tradition, showcasing more of Japan's quiet, historical sides. Goldenrod is fairly modern, but Ekritik, which is based on Kyoto, is incredibly deep in myths and stories of old, with the legendary birds and beasts. Even their legendaries are mirrors. Mewtwo is modern, cloning, science, while Ho-Oh and Lugia are long-established myths that have been around for ages. I think it's a really nice pairing, and I'll shut up about Johto. <laughs> I did six hours on that already. The point is, Kanto is cool in context. Um, now let's shit on the Kano starters some. They're kind of bad in this game. That's a little unfair. They're, they're pretty usable, they have good stats. As always, the game begins with a short intro and a starter giveaway. There's little to say about Professor Oak, or even particularly Palette, save that you can skip ever getting the town map. Not that you'll want it, since it eats up bag space. The three starters are a mixed bag. Bulbasaur is Grass Poison type, becoming Ivysaur at 16, Venusaur at 32, slightly before the other two. On the upside, Bulbasaur has an easy start, being super effective against the first two gyms and resisting the two after. But they also just don't have a lot of stuff to do. Grass moves are fairly limited in scope, despite Venusaur's decent special and all-around bulkiness, and it only actually gets Poison Powder for Poison moves, or Toxic VTM, sort of negating its secondary type's usefulness in offensive situations. Not to mention being pretty middling in defense, especially as it's four times weak to bug in this generation, and early caves have a lot of leech life going on. The biggest flaw is kind of a light lack of moves. It only gets offensive normal and grass moves by level up, which is to say the least, at least a bit limiting. Its best move is Razor Leaf, which always crits, preventing boosting, and which it doesn't get until right before evolving into Venusaur. Before that, it's Tackle, Leech Seed, and Vine Whip. Even at obscenely high levels for this game, it gets Solar Beam, whose charge turn is unnegatable without Sun, and since it comes before the attack, it's pretty slow and hard to use, which means sticking with Razor Leaf for most of the game. Which, I mean, the way crits work means that Razor Leaf doesn't fall off for quite a while, but towards the end of the game, it starts to be a kind of weight on it. It also gets Sleep Powder, eventually, at level 56. Sleep Powder would be a great move for helping catch things or just slowing things down, but getting it at 56, you're pretty much at the end of the game, probably not catching a whole lot more things. Charmander's line, Charmeleon at 16, Charizard at 36, the first two are Pure Fire, while Charizard is Fire Flying, aren't a whole lot better off. In fact, they're pretty much definitively the worst ones to use. They're weak to the first two gyms, which makes for a very miserable early game, and while not as bad against everything as Chikorita was, they really only get one positive big battle in the game, and a bunch of negatives, and uh, a handful of neutral battles. The Fire Flying typing isn't horrible in this game, Rock only has two moves, one of which is dreadfully bad, and it has some okay defensive properties, plus good speed and decent everything else, although not very specialized. But fuck if Charizard gets a whole lot of anything. <laughs> Normal and Fire moves only by level up, and no flying moves, even by TM. Doesn't get fly. Stab is entirely unused, although it does give it a ground immunity, which is nice. Which means it's relying on Ember for most of the game, which it gets at level 9, and it doesn't get any other fire moves until Flamethrower at 46. Granted, there are things it gets that aren't terrible. Earthquake and Sword Stance by TM is really good, but for most of the game you're relying on Slash, which always crits, which means that, you know, it can't take good advantage of Sword Stance, but at the same time it gets past boosting. Rock types especially are a bit of an issue, with uh, the uh, only having fire and normal moves for the most part. 
And then finally, there's the Water Starter Squirrel, who maintains its pure water typing at 16 with War Turtle and 36 with Blastoise. Water is kind of always going to be the strongest starter type, never mind that it decimates the first gym. The fact that by mid-game it has Surf due to it being an HM, which is the strongest water move in the game, sans the pretty inaccurate Hydro Pump, which is only 30 base power above, giving it access to its best move a solid 15-ish levels before the other Pokemon get them. Even though it's a bit weaker offensively, thanks to middling speed and attack stats, mostly focusing on defense, it's Pokemon that carries a lot of weight throughout the game, far more than the others. And that's before considering that water types almost all have access to Ice's coverage through Ice Beam and Blizzard, which serves to shut down Grass, one of their two weaknesses. All three are good designs, Charizard and Blastoise hit the cool, while Venusaur treads the line of cool and weird, but I think there's little doubt to which is the most usable of the three, at least if you're like planning on using it throughout, or like primarily leaning on it, obviously you get more and more options as the game goes on, it becomes less and less important, there are flaws, but I think Squirtle is pretty easy to say the most usable of the three in a general sense. The other important part of Palette is your rival, Professor Oak's grandson. He's technically nameless, but he's usually called Blue in America. Uh, since Japan had red and green, he's usually called Green over there. The Gen 2 games call him Blue. But people tend to exaggerate how mean he is or see him as a bully, but that's a pretty off take that I imagine comes from distorted memories. He's undeniably arrogant and a touch rude, but he also cheers you on and motivates you to keep up because he enjoys the back and forth and will usually point you the right way whenever you have your various encounters with him. In Palette, he takes whichever starter is the strong one against yours, as rivals tended to do at the time. Although in the first battle, it hardly matters. The battle is so simple and limited that it basically comes down to luck, and there's no punishment for losing. The free level for winning, an extra bit of money, is nice. But if you lose, he doesn't take any money from you. You just miss out on that little extra. Palette exists on the sea, although that's obviously inaccessible for right now, which only leaves the path forward to the north. Despite its simplicity, Route 1 has a pretty neat design. On your way up, you're forced to go through the grass at certain points, but going back down with Oak's parcel, the path has ledges that can be used to avoid all but the last bit of grass. It's a nice way to keep going up and down this short route three times from getting too stale. Route 1 has two Pokemon on it. First Pidgey, Normal Flying, which evolves at 18 into Pidgeotto, and 36 into Pidgeot. They're... not great. The biggest blow to them is the lack of flying moves. Gust is, for whatever reason, normal type in Gen 1, and their first flying move by level up, which is also their last, is Wing Attack, which they get shortly before becoming Pidgeot, which is also their weakest damaging move. Even by TM, they can only get more normal or flying moves, basically peaking at the mediocre two-turn move Fly. Rattata fares a lot better. It's pure normal and evolves into Raticate at 20. The pair are really fast and make good use of normal stab, even if it's most of what they get. It's not made worse by two solid signature moves. Hyper Fang, which has 80 base power, which is massive in general in Gen 1, let alone for how early they get it. And Super Fang, which halves an opponent's HP. Given that Full Swipe doesn't exist yet, this is actually an incredible catching move in this game. While not as insane as some other normal types, they also get solid coverage from TMs, with moves like Dig, which has 100 base power in this game, which is extremely good for how early you get it. Viridian doesn't have a lot going on in all honesty. We're still really far outside the denser cities, so outside of the usual center and shop, there's just a handful of villagers in a gym. This one being closed for now is the leaders away. On the first stop here, before delivering Oak's parcel from the Mart, a man lays in the road leading north. In the international versions of the game, he hasn't had his coffee, and he's grumpy, um, laying in the road which is just a nonsense way to censor that he's passed out with a hangover in the Japanese version. East of this small town is Route 22, a route that connects to the Pokemon League, which itself requires all badges, but does optionally have Pokemon to get in a rematch with Blue. To touch on the latter first, Blue's Pokemon are decently leveled. His starter, as well as a Pidgey, which is actually a bit more dangerous than it seems, simply because it has a 50-50 chance of using Sand Attack to shit up your accuracy. All Pokemon in this game, even ones used by trainers, use the last four moves in their level up move sets and pick them at random unless they have the not so aptly named good AI, which I'll come back to. The grass on the route has Spearow, which is normal flying, which becomes Spearow at 20. It's really fast and has good attack, the line is far stronger than Pidgey's. It starts immediately with a flying move, gets Leer to further reduce enemy defenses, and eventually gets Drill Peck, which is the strongest flying move in the game besides Sky Attack, which requires a charge turn. Both Nidorans are also available here. Both are pure poison, evolve at 16, then again by Moonstone, whereupon they gain the ground type. Although it's worth noting that in these games especially, when a Pokemon evolves via stones, it stops learning level up moves almost entirely, which has lessened up over time, so you may want to hold off on evolving them too early. Nidoran male is substantially more common in red and female in blue, although it makes very 
little difference. The two serve as a demo of sorts of the gender system that would be included in every game after, which is why they're split up like this, which makes them kind of interesting and unique in this game specifically. Nidoran Female's line, which also includes Nidorina and Nidoqueen, is the more balanced of the two. The best part of Nidoqueen, as well as her male counterparts, are their insane coverage, that they can use fairly well due to an attempt to make them specially defensive to play into their type. Surf, Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, Fire Blast, for whatever reason, this thing can do a little of everything. Nidoran Male's line, with Nidorino and Nidoking, leans far heavier into physical attacking, giving it monstrous stab on Earthquake, and also double kick and rock slide for some physical coverage. Its special is a bit worse than Needle Queen's, but still pretty serviceable, and it has the same immense coverage on that side too, which makes either some of the most fun and powerful Pokémon to use throughout the game with some proper investments. Route 2 is split in half both ways. The entire right side is inaccessible, and vertically it's split by Viridian Forest. The grass on either end is identical. In red it contains Weedle, and blue it contains Caterpie, although neither are true version exclusives. Caterpie is pure bug and evolves into Metapod at 7, then Butterfree at 10 while gaining flying. Caterpie and Metapod are basically joke Pokemon, but things don't wildly improve with Butterfree. Horrific typing, drenched in weaknesses, mediocre stats across the board, which is a shame because if it was even moderately more usable, all the psychic coverage it gets would be kind of good. It's weak because it evolves early, but it's far too weak to get anywhere past the first two or three gyms, unless you're attempting to challenge yourself. Weedle isn't much better off, Bug Poison is a betterish type, and it becomes Cocoon at 7, then Beedrill at 10. Its attack is low, but serviceable enough, but it has pretty pitiful stats elsewhere, and relies on low power bug moves like Pin Missile and its signature Twin Needle. Well, its strongest poison move is the pretty pathetic Poison Sting. Like its counterpart, it can be really serviceable early on, but it kind of falls apart pretty quickly as you extend into the game further and further. Viridian Forest is the first dungeon in the game. It's a non-traditional one in a lot of ways. Grass is still in play, like on the route, so encounters are mostly optional, and it serves as a small maze. It's not complex enough to be confusing, but enough so to make note of it. I love how dungeons can be distinctly not dungeons in this game. Both of the bugs are available here, with Red having very common Weedles and rare Caterpies and vice versa. This is one of the few places in the game where the version differences actually impacts gameplay, as Weedle is capable of poisoning the player pretty easily. Bulbasaur is immune and double resists, which makes Red a fair bit easier for it, while the others need to play significantly more carefully as poison damage adds up pretty fast this early. Pikachu, which is pure electric, is also available as a fairly rare encounter here and evolves into Raichu via Thunderstone. The two are fairly limited, only capable of using normal electric attacks. Their electric attacks are pretty wicked, but they're fairly limited on good normal moves. I'll have a lot more to say about Pikachu later, unfortunately. But I think you can make decent use of Raichu if you don't mind it being limited to using some powerful electric moves and nothing else. And finally, we reach another town. I like the vibe in Pewter. It's a quiet little town just outside of the cities. Beyond the gym, it also has a museum. The 500 yen entry fee isn't really worth paying. You'll be wanting to dump your scraps of money into Pokeballs, but I think it's a really neat area. You can examine the fossils in the museum to see really cool sprites of the fossil Pokemon skeletons, and there's a lot of unique assets that just aren't used anywhere else. It's a really interesting area, even if it's kind of hard to justify going to it this early in the game. The gym here is rock type. Well, only two of the four Pokemon in the gym are rock, but all four are ground, but close enough, I suppose. There's not really a gym puzzle. Uh, there's the choice to walk around the junior trainer in the gym if you don't want the free experience for whatever reason. Rock is a pretty interesting type choice in that it's one of the few types that interacts with all three starter types. Rock's Geodude and Onyx are both rock ground. Once Bulbasaur has Vine Whip and Squirtle has Water Gun, they can pretty easily one-shot both. While Charmander has much more of an uphill battle, given Rock has a resistance to fire. On paper, it's a good way of teaching the player about type differences, although Charmander is put in a very bad spot for that lesson. It's not just that he can't do much to them, in fact their awful special means that even resisted its Ember will do okay damage. Although badly timing one against Onyx can be rough due to its by reflecting double damage back, and Charmander being pretty frail, but also that there's kind of nothing better. Rock resists normal, so Pidgey, Rattata, the Nidorans, Spearow, and Caterpie are out. Flying as well for Spearow, Poison for the Nidorans and Weedle line, Immune to Electric for Pikachu. There's no real option to take advantage of the weakness system, just an option to be walled by it, which makes the early game pretty miserable for Charmander. The closest the game has to a real out is Butterfree, who has non-stab neutral damage confusion, and a 4 times rock weakness. That doesn't come up, but it feels a little bit short-sighted. Anyway, Geodude is ass. Rock though is balanced around being used against you, so it has awful accuracy, and Onyx's bite is dangerous if you don't think. But if you just spam status while it's biting, then it can't do anything, can't reflect damage it doesn't take. And then you can finally get your attack boost from your first badge and the ability to use the thrilling field move Flash, although the HM is a ways off. 
The TM Brock gives you, buy it, is actually the first in the entire game at all, as if your options weren't limited enough. These things also eat up bag space, so you either want to use them, sell them, or throw them in the PC. Well, the PC itself also has limited space, so the first two are preferable. Managing the bag is constantly not fun in this game. East Computer is Route 3, and while the game has no good way of showing it, this is rising uphill towards a mountain cave. It'd be kind of neat if they could actually have some way of showing that. Like, there's the, uh, the ledges that kinda show it, but they don't exactly, like, go the right direction. This is the first route with Kano's famous trainer walls. To be honest, I don't mind them. Trainers give great experience, and Kanto, for all its fault, keeps you pretty nicely leveled to the gyms by defeating every trainer, even with a full team of six. Route 3's only new Pokemon is Jigglypuff, which is a normal type and becomes Wigglytuff when exposed to a Moonstone. It has pretty titanic HP, below average attack, and is pretty awful elsewhere. Its biggest benefit is the same massive special coverage most of the normals in this game get. Pretty much all get Thunderbolts, they pretty much all get like Fire Blast and Ice Beam. It's a discount version of a half dozen other normal types that also have this insane special coverage and better stats to use it with. A small portion of Route 4 is available before the next dungeon. While it only contains a Pokemon Center because the dungeon is pretty awful, there is a Pokemon available despite the lack of grass. The player can purchase a Magikarp for 500 yen. This is completely unjustifiable as Magikarp can be obtained fairly soon for free, but it's funny that a scammer is selling a shitty fish. Magikarp is pure water and only knows Splash until level 15 where it learns Tackle, and that's all of its moves. At 20 it becomes Gyarados, which gains the flying type and is one of the strongest Pokemon in the game. Insane attack, very solid special. It's a bit of a grind to get there, but it's very worth it. It's a fantastic Hyper Beam user, especially because of how Hyper Beam works in this game, where you hit one, you don't have the recharge turn, you just keep going. But it's still really solid at using water moves as well. It's just a shame that they're all special. It's obvious how it's supposed to be used, though. It's kind of a cliched Pokemon to use now, but on release it would have been a really cool twist to grind up a defenseless pain in the ass for the reward of an absolute monster. Just like the Legend of the Carp climbing the waterfall to become a dragon, which it's based on. Mount Loon is a bad dungeon. It's not so much it does anything wrong, it just doesn't have anything going on. It's far too long for what you have, as pretty much everything you have at this point is going to be solely using normal moves and the two most common Pokemon in it have the potential to be very annoying when encountered. Geodude is horribly defensive and walls out anything besides the starters, and Zubat can cause confusion and Leech Life tears Bulbasaur apart. There's no puzzles, primarily because there are no HMs yet to design them around, and only the first floor of three has any maze-like qualities, with an open floor plan and some fake-out ladders to lower floors, but upon leaving this first floor, the latter are all just hallways with an occasional rocket grub. The scientist at the end has some interesting Pokémon with some mid-game electric types like Voltorb and Magnemite, and as a reward for defeating him, the player can choose between the Helix and Dome Fossils. I'll come back to the fossils when they're revivable, but unfortunately these are hard one-offs, and without breeding, sans via Gold, Silver, and Crystal Time Machine, you'll need at least another half playthrough for dex completion. There are four brand new Pokémon here. Zubat dominates the dungeon, and as I said before, is a huge pain for Bulbasaur, but is fairly frail and gets less common the lower floor you're on, while the percentages for everything else slowly raises. Zubat is poison flying and evolves into Golbat at 22. They resist mediocre types, they're weak to great offensive types, they have decent speed, and they're pretty bad elsewhere, as well as a barren moveset. The only poison move they get is Toxic by TM, its best stab is Wing Attack, it's a flying type that cannot use Fly, and the best thing it gets is Bite. Geodude is Ground Rock, it evolves into Graveler at 25, then again by trade into Golem, somewhat kneecapping how usable the line is going to be for a lot of people. Even so, they're not great regardless. The defense and attack are really good, but the amount of common weaknesses, including Double to Grass and Water, Garbage Special, and Pathetic Speed are going to make it pretty hard to use. Not to say that they're all bad. Stab Earthquake by Level Up and Rock Slide by TM are really nasty moves. It's just that there's going to be struggles with it going down so quickly to so many common types. Paris is Bug Grass and becomes Parasect at 24. They're cool, but barely use them. Spore is the only perfectly accurate sleep move in the game, which is great and all, but Parasect is tied for the slowest fully evolved in the game, and even its best stat attack is underwhelming and underutilized, plus the terrible typing. <laughs> Four times weak to poison, flying, and fire in this game, 
And then finally, there's Clefairy, who's pure normal and evolves by Moonstone into Clefable. There's a Moonstone in Mount Moon for free, by the way, and every Pokemon in the game that evolves by it is available by the time you reach Mount Moon, which is kind of neat. Nidoking is easily the best, although Clefable itself is really good. Its stats are pretty evened out, but its special is really solid and it gets great normal coverage that makes it a great special attacker off of Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, Fire Blast, Psychic. Plus enough attack to use normal moves well, like Body Slam, which makes it a really good jack of all trades in this game. The back half of Route 4 better showcases the height of Mount Moon, consisting of a series of ledges that leads down to a grassy patch. There's actually no way back up for the time being, so with every other exit blocked in one way or another, you're locked into a small area for a while, which is pretty much the last time the games bother trying to restrict you that much. Route 4 has the first true version exclusives, although at this point the differences aren't going to change how you interact with routes in any meaningful way. Red gets Ekans, which is pure poison, becomes Arbok at 22. Very mediocre all around, and as for Stab, they peak at 40 base power Acid. Glare is a very mediocre signature move that lets them paralyze things, but at a much lower accuracy than Thunder Wave, which has 100 accuracy, which tons of stuff gets. Blue gets the much more solid Sandshrew. He's a uh, solid because he's made of bricks. Uh, it's pure ground and evolves into Sand Slash at 22. It has fantastic defense and attack, but it's pretty mediocre elsewhere. Their speed is still high enough to make Slash, which they get by level up, always crits, while Stab Earthquake is undeniably great regardless, even if they only get it through TM. Ignoring Cerulean for a moment, the northern path needs to be completed either before or after the gym in Cerulean, but it's much easier, which makes a nice spot to get leveled for the gym. Route 24 begins as Nugget Bridge. There's a rival battle first, though. He has his starter, Pidgeotto, which is evolved from his Pidgey, Rattata, and an Abra. Abra can't attack as it only knows teleport, but I like the detail that he caught it on 24 before fighting you and hasn't had time to get it real attacks yet. It's a cute little world-building thing, and it becomes a main member of his team. The rest of the bridge is a lot of trainer battles, the final of which gives you a nugget worth 5,000 yen for trying to bribe you into joining Team Rocket. The grass alongside 24 has the second version exclusives. Red gets Oddish, which is Grass Poison, becomes Gloom at 21, and Vileplume by Leaf Stone. There's a lot of common weaknesses and only a handful of resists. Vileplume is a far inferior Venusaur, and even with really decent special, it's just all around okay. It's insufferably slow, only has Acid as a Poison Stab, and even its signature Petal Dance, which gets pretty solid in later generations when its power's buffed, is pretty weak for the cost of confusing itself. Blue gets the better offering again with its counterpart Bellsprout, also a three-stage Grass Poison line, Weepin Bell at 21, Victory Bell by Leafstone, obvious by their companion. Victory Bell is substantially faster, although still not amazing, but shaves down its defense and HP to dump it all into attack and special, giving it good special defense and really strong stab razor leaves. It's limited in coverage, like most grasses are, but it gets wrapped early on, and since trapping is so strong in this game, if you can keep getting lucky and landing it, it's the stronger of the two by far, and a very solid Venusaur substitute if you want something like that. Both versions also get Abra, which becomes Kadabra at 16, and Alakazam by trade. Simply by virtue of being pure psychic, uh, these things are monsters. Even Abra, who only gets teleport, can still be great with enough TMs, because it has massive special and speed. Alakazam has some of the highest of both, although its other stats are pretty terrible. Not that it matters. Level up enough to use Psychic or use the TM if you're impatient, recover for healing and whatever special coverage you want, and you have an absolute monster. Even if you can't evolve it, Kadabra is still absolutely great and usable in the same way, just a tiny bit less so. Route 25 above that is a lot more trainer battles. There's a variety of types and trainers, and it's good experience, but beyond moving one trainer strategically to get an item without needing to come back with cut later, there's nothing all that interesting going on, and the encounters are nothing new. On the far end is Bill, who's turned himself into a Pokemon, Morty, he's Pokey Bill. In exchange for returning him to normal, the player's given the SS ticket, which comes up in a little bit. To loop back in on Cerulean, the town is a bit more condensed and busier than the former two. The bike shop is here, but bikes cost more than the player can even hold. There's a trade we can't do for a while, a police officer guarding a door to prevent entry, and Cerulean Gym. Like in Brock's gym, one of the two trainers can be avoided by walking around them, although the other is unavoidable. Misty is kinda insane. Bulbasaur's line should have very few issues, as the movesets of Rosario and Starmie are pretty awful. Tackle, Water Gun, Bubble Beam. But Starmie is statistically one of the best Pokemon in the game, the highest base stat total on an ace Pokemon of any of the leaders, plus it's so ludicrously fast that it has about a 1 in 3 chance of critting every turn. Charmander does not have a chance, and Squirtle struggles to make meaningful progress on it beyond just bashing into it with Bite and hoping to out-DPS it. It's not nearly as bad because Oddish and Bellsprout are available, and it's the last major wall for a long time. Plus, when you clear it, you can use Cut outside of battle when you get it. You also get Bubble Beam, which is a really nice boost to Squirtle early on, and another reason I think it's the strongest of the three. 
The east path out of Cerulean is blocked by a tree that can't be cut yet, but the south part is open by the officer moving aside and also lets the player get dig. A nice move to have for indoor areas given how horrifically slow this game can be at times, especially interiors, as it allows the player to warp to the start of a dungeon. Or more specifically in this game, it warps them to the last Pokemon Center they visited. Road 5 to the south is pretty basic, with optional grass in the center, which also leads to the daycare for raising Pokemon, although there's no breeding in this game, so it's just for gaining levels. Red gets Mankey, which is a pure fighting type, which becomes Primeape at 28. Fighting types are in pretty limited supply, and the attack and speed are nice, especially as Karate Chop always crits when used by Primeape. The worst you can really say is that fighting just isn't a very useful type in this generation, which isn't a knock on Primeape, it's just an unfortunate issue with the types that are common in this game. Psychic is the best type in the game, which means fighting is not very good, and there's also not very many good fighting moves. Karate Chop is also normal in this generation, so even though it always crits, it's just not that great on Primeape. Bloonstead gets Meowth, which is pure normal and also evolves at 28 into Persian. Persian is very fast, but has pretty mediocre stats everywhere else. Slash always crits and gets Payday, which gives a bit of extra income, but it has pretty weak special coverage compared to the other pure normals or coverage at all, which limits it to being a pretty decent normal user, but not much else. The gateway into the nearby city is blocked off by a very thirsty gate guard. It's a fairly transparent but amusing roadblock that forces the player to take the underground tunnel to pass through to the other side. You can trade a Nidoran male for a Nidoran female, but why would you? This takes you out on Route 6, a simple route that has the same Pokemon as Route 5 and a handful of trainers that can be avoided by going through the grass. Vermilion City beyond that is a seaport. It seems to be a fairly new town given that there's a small construction area. The gym is inaccessible without cut, but there's various other things to see. The Pokemon Fan Club president gives you a voucher for a free bike, which helps the game's pace a lot if you're willing to go back to Cerulean for it. The Fisherman's House lets you pick up the old rod. Uh, it can only be used to get Magikarp in this game, so it's not very useful. It does allow you to do it basically anywhere, including in gyms, where you can infamously fish in the gym statues to pull up Magikarps. The SSAN is docked right outside of town, and there's a trade to get Farfetch for a Spearow, the only way to get it in this game, leaving it stuck with the horrible name Ducks. Farfetch is normal flying and doesn't evolve. It has okay stats when you get it, but is roughly on par with most middle stage Pokemon, meaning it falls off pretty fast, and is nowhere near Fero, although it does have some cool stuff. It always crits on Slash, it gets Swords Dance by level up, which is pretty unique. To the east of Vermilion is Route 11. It's fully optional, but it's loaded with trainers for experience, and the grass in the area has Drowsy, which evolves into Hypno 26. It's a more defensive pure psychic, although due to how special works, this means it also hits very hard with psychic moves especially. It's not nearly as fast or powerful as Alakazam or even Kadabra, but has much better survivability. Its only real flaw is lacking any good coverage. It gets some normal moves, but isn't tossing out T-Bolt like every other psychic. The SSN itself is a neat area. It's a very odd dungeon in that there's no wild encounters and only one battle you actually need to do against Blue. There's a ton of optional fights for TMs, including Body Slam, which is one of the better TMs in this game, but all that matters is the rival fights. His Rattata, Abra, and Starter have all evolved, although the titanic amount of experience available on the SSN makes him relatively free because there's so many optional trainers. Even if his Raticate and Kadabra especially can be really strong for this point in the game with their decently powerful psychic moves and uh, Hyper Fang. This fight lets the player get the Cut HM from the Captain, which causes the SSN to leave forever. Anything you miss is gone for good. This also allows you to get into Lieutenant Surge's gym, although you could just not and come back later if you wanted. There's no real reason to, and you'd be cut off from using fly until you come back, but you certainly have the option. The gym also has the worst puzzle in the game, to use the term puzzle very generously. There's a bunch of trash cans in rows in the gym, and you need to systematically check each one for a switch, then guess at which one of the adjacent cans has the other switch. If you guess wrong, it resets, and the switch's positions are shuffled. If you're lucky and get a corner, you have a coin flip, and at worst, it's 25%. Except there's a bug that sometimes causes the proper trash can to just be the one at the top left, making your odds slightly worse. There's no deduction or reasoning to it, you just guess and check until eventually you win the coin toss. It's very tedious, and if you get unlucky, it can drag on for like 10 minutes. Lieutenant Surge is a really odd character. His nickname is the Lightning American, further tying Gen 1's Kanto to real-world Kanto. He also mentions a war that is the basis for so much cringe fan theorization that I'm just going to say the intention was that he was an American station at Japan, either following Vietnam or Korea, which lines up properly with the timeline of this game taking place in 1996, at least in this game. Lieutenant Surge uses the electric type. Voltorb and Pikachu are non-issues, but his Raichu is really fast and hits pretty hard. Granted, this is mostly moot. You're guaranteed to have Dig to absolutely terminate everything, and if you push ahead early, both games have access to ground types that Surge is mostly incapable of touching, only able to hit them with weak normal moves. 
It's possible to just return to Cerulean, cut the tree, and head east, but it's pretty obviously not intended here, as just outside of Vermilion is a fresh path to Diglett's cave. This is technically optional and can be accessed pre-surge, but the game clearly wants you to take this path for various reasons. The only two Pokémon available in this short, linear cave are Diglett and its evolution Dugtrio, which it becomes a 26, both are pure ground. As you may imagine, they pretty much just get Dig, Earthquake, and a spattering of normal moves, plus Rock Slide by TM, but their main purpose is just to be the Team Earthquaker and or Digger. Diglett's cave exits out onto the right side of Route 2. There are two reasons to come here. First, if the player's caught 10 Pokémon, Professor Oak's aid will give them Flash. This isn't technically necessary, as there's only one cave that uses it, and you can pretty easily get through it blind, but this half of Route 2 also has a trade, an Abra for the game's only Mr. Mime. Between every version of Gen 1, it's the only Pokémon to solely be obtainable through trade in all of the games, with its fellow trade exclusives being available somewhere in the wild in one version or the other. Like most pure psychics, it's an off-brand Alakazam, fast and good special, but pretty bad elsewhere. Cut also lets the player into the side of the museum. Here they can get the old Amber, which can be revived later. The Jurassic Park was very popular. Please understand. Either by returning through Mount Moon or Diglett's Cave, the path east to Cerulean is open. Route 9, nothing new to catch, but a lot of trainers that have fairly interesting stuff. Bellsprout's Oddishes, a Charmander. The layout isn't bad, incorporating the ledges for optional areas, although it would have been nice if there was some required interaction. Route 10 seems even more empty, only one trainer near the entrance to the cave, also a Pokemon Center because they knew that the cave sucks. Some water on the right that can't be interacted with yet, which serves as a tease for things later, and a bit of grass featuring Voltorb as a newly available Pokemon. It rolls a 30 into Electrode and is a pure electric type. Electrode is the fastest Pokemon in the game and has passable special, but they're a pretty uphill battle. They don't actually get electric moves by level up, meaning they require investment of TMs, and at the end of the day, Raichu is only slightly slower and hits substantially harder. It's also worth noting that Vault Torb and Electrode pretty much only exist for the sake of something that comes up later that I'll talk about that's funny. Rock Tunnel is honestly dreadful. There's a reason everyone hates this cave. Flash can be used to light it up, but honestly, you can see walls and ladders without it, so the only thing you're not able to see is trainers. There's a lot of trainers, enough that you'll probably end up having to go back to replenish power points at some point, if not health. And the cave has pretty tedious encounters too. Geodudes, Onyxes, Golbats, not to mention no items and not even anything interesting going on. The cave is basically linear, with a few short fake-out paths and nothing to find on them. On the plus side, we've got some new captures. Onyx, we've already been introduced to. Rock Ground, a bad type. Incredible defense and mediocre speed, but awful elsewhere. Machop is also here, pure fighting, it becomes Machoke at 28 and Machamp by trade. The attack stat is massive, but the speed is really awful, and like I said with Mankey, fighting just isn't that great in Kanto, especially given how Karate Chop is a normal type. It actually has insane enough attack to use normal moves, Earthquake, Rock Slide really well, but the line is pretty heavily limited by its speed. It's the best fighting type that you have access to, save maybe one, but still not all that great regardless. As cool as Lavender Town is, a lot of it is pretty well inaccessible for now. It exits south and west. South goes to Route 12, and while you can travel down in a ways and fight a few trainers, it eventually hits a dead end thanks to a sleeping Pokémon. At this point, you actually do have a lot of freedom. From here, given some routing, you could potentially have skipped Surge and can do gyms 4, 5, and 6 at any time, and defeating 5, irregardless of the others, also allows you to go to 7, although they all need to be eventually beaten to fight the 8th. I'll be going more or less in order, or the intended order, but I'll talk about branches here and there. I think it's kind of interesting how wacky you can get with your route in this game. To the west is Route 8, which includes yet another version exclusive set. Red getting Growlithe, which becomes Arcanine when exposed to a Firestone. Both are pure fire. Arcanine is very powerful with great speed and attack and solid everything else. It's a shame that there's no physical fire moves and that it's otherwise limited to dig and normal coverage. That said, it's solid enough in both stats to play a pretty good mixed role, and fire is a very limited type in this game regardless. Vulpix is the counterpart in blue, and likewise is pure fire, and evolves by Firestone into Ninetales. It's very fast, and leans way more special, but Ninetales won't learn the better fire moves like Flamethrower, meaning it needs to be kept as a Vulpix for a fairly long stretch of time. It also lacks any non-fire special moves at all, meaning it requires a lot of TMs to just be a mediocre attacker. Saffron's west entrance is blocked by another thirsty guard. In fact, they all are, like some sort of guard hive mind that protects Saffron. The underground path leads to Route 7, which is the shortest route in the game, and has the same Pokémon available as 8. Celadon is finally the big city, a portion of Tokyo. It's not as bustling as Saffron, but it arguably has more going on. The apartment building has a lot of people to talk to, and houses the Game Freak office, where you can chat up the developers with some odd meta-commentary. This correlates roughly to where their office was at the time. The department store sells items not found anywhere else, like vitamins that permanently raise Pokémon stats, drinks that can be traded for TMs or used to bribe entry into Saffron, 
for a meager 2100 yen each. Fully repeatable to round out any stone evolutions you need, including by trading things back here to evolve for gold, silver, and crystal, where you cannot just buy these stones for some reason. A gym and the game corner. A gambling hall lined with slot machines where the winnings can be traded away for TMs or rare Pokemon. The slot machine game, it, it's, it's, it's a slot machine. Nothing to it. Ignoring the gym for a bit, at the top of the apartment complex is a free EV, a normal type that evolves into Vaporeon, a water type with Waterstone, Flareon Fire by Firestone, or Jolteon Electric by Thunderstone. This is the game's only EV, so these are unfortunately a choice. Each of Eevee's evolutions focuses on different stats, which makes them all kind of fall into different roles. Vaporeon's special and HP are massive, while everything else is kind of mediocre. This makes it far and away the best of the bunch, especially due to water generally having access to better moves like Surf fairly soon, as well as Ice moves for coverage. But it's really bulky, hard to kill, especially from special moves, hits like a truck. Jolteon is speed and special, it hits the same niche Raichu does, but to its credit it has some weird extra coverage in the bug move Pin Missile and Fighting Type Double Kick. It's pretty good, and it's fairly unique as far as electric types in this go, who mostly fall into kind of the same niche. Flareon is attack and special. This is the game it's best in, but the lack of speed really just makes it a discount Arcanine. Its special is better by a decent amount, which makes it closer to mix, but it can hardly find two physical moves to scrape together, and fire moves are hard to come by. The game corner Pokémon are almost all available elsewhere, with only the most expensive being exclusive to it, although for whatever reason it's far cheaper in blue than red, where it costs the maximum amount of coins you can hold. Abra Clefairy and Nidorina in red, or Nidorino in blue, have all been available before, while Scyther, Pinsir, and Jatini are all available in the Safari Zone shortly after, at a much, much lower price, especially given how much you need to save up for Porygon. Scyther is exclusive to red and has the atrocious bug flying type, although Scyther is solid despite it. Being extremely fast with high attack, it learns neither bug nor flying moves, meaning it relies entirely on normal moves. It's not optimal, but it hits hard as hell despite that. Slash always crits and it gets sword stance to boost other moves, but optimally it would have had some sort of stab to complement its great speed and attack. Like, wing attack even would have been kind of nice. Pinsir is exclusive to blue as Scyther's counterpart, although it is pure bug. Like Scyther, it also has great attack, but trades in speed for defense, which isn't the best straight off given how weak to special damage bug is. Like Scyther, it lacks bug moves, but it does get a few fighting moves of all things to supplement itself while keeping access to Slash and Sword Stance. It is the lesser bug, and perhaps even more niche, but it's still a solid second for bugs as far as it goes. Dratini is this generation's pseudo-legendary, which means it has 600 base stat total when it's fully evolved. It's not 600 in this game, it's 600 in games after this game, because they had to split the special stat. You, you get it. You, you get it. It's also the only Dragon-type line in the game, starting Pier, evolving into Dragonair at 30, and Dragonite while gaining the flying type at 55. Far and away the worst Pokémon to grind in the game. Much like Gyarados, it was given Titanic attacks so that it can use Hyper Beam well, and despite that, it pretty much exclusively gets special moves outside of Hyper Beam. It gets all the big special coverage, and it has good special too, but it probably should have been the focus. It's also really bulky, but fairly slow. Not unusably slow, like Parasect or something, but less so than you'd hope. It's not to say it's bad to use, it's very versatile, and you can kind of make whatever with it. It just feels a little underwhelming at the end of the day. Lastly, at a massive 9,999 coins in red and a still very big 6,666 coins in blue is Porygon, the only Pokémon actually exclusive to the game corner. I guess the ominous rocket air around the place is a cover for stolen Silphco tech, as well as Pokémon that they've been smuggling. You can find a guy who pretty directly states this in Celadon. Porygon is implied to be a new invention by Silphco, the first digital Pokémon that's been snatched to be sold in a shitty casino. Porygon is a normal type, its stats are actually pretty middling and it's slow, but it has decent coverage with Psychic and Ice Beam. In later generations, it's definitely more of a coverage all-rounder, plus some gimmicks that are intended to let it use Stab with anything. Conversion changes Porygon to match its opponent's typing, which is situationally useful. Situationally gives it Stab on coverage, and for a lot of types makes it resist the opponent, at the very least. If it wasn't such a titanic money sink, it'd be really cool to use, but it's pretty difficult to actually get, and by the time you do, it's not really worth the cost. Beneath the game corner is the Team Rocket Hideout, a mid-sized dungeon that can be found by people gossiping about town. The rockets are basically the Yakuza, so tying them into gambling, plus the ominousness of the prize room, is a nice way to indicate that something weird is going on there. The dungeon is... it's an interesting theme, if nothing else. A secret criminal headquarters under a casino is neat and weirdly realistic. 
There's no wild Pokemon, but there's a good heap of rockets to fight who all use basically the same stuff. Coughing, Ekans, Raticate, Zubat. Anything mean looking and weak basically. <laughs> the main gimmick of the dungeon is these spinning floor panels that send you one way until you hit a bumpy floor tile. Which is a fine puzzle element actually, but the speed they send you at is insanely slow, even worse than walking, and completely kills the pace of the puzzle segments. Especially if you make a small mistake and you're forced to take like seven more fucking spinners to get around. The elevator key thing is a little mean too. After you defeat the guy holding it, you need to talk to him a second time, which you otherwise never need to do in the game. Giovanni, the leader of the Rockets, is here too, looking into the Silphscope as Underling stole, and he gets his first battle. He's Onyx, Rhyhorn, and Kangaskhan. There isn't much to say about this first fight. The first two are the terrible rock ground type, and you'll probably have a grass or water to just one-shot them, although Rhyhorn does hit pretty hard for this point in the game. Kangaskhan is a pretty bulky threat and pretty much carries this battle, but it kind of just spams mid-damage normal moves, so it's not like he's terribly interesting even if he can be a little bit of a roadblock. Ignoring the newly acquired Sylph Scope for one more minute, the gym in town belongs to Erica. There's not really a gym puzzle beyond there's a lot of trainers, but I like the pervy guy spying in outside because it's an all-female gym. Her victory bell is fine, her Vileplume is okay, and her Tangle doesn't even have any grass type moves. She's probably the easiest leader in the game, although there's some close competition elsewhere as the AI is so dreadful that it just really doesn't matter what you send in because they're just going to use random moves that don't do anything. Wes's Celadon is another sleeping Pokemon, walling off the game to that side and limiting options some. In the same direction, there's a secret house that has Fly for getting around quicker. Saffron is accessible thanks to the drinks from the department store, but the game pretty obviously doesn't intend you to do that yet, as a majority of the city centers on another huge rocket dungeon, unless you're to assume that the rockets including Giovanni all immediately bolted there for their next plan to wait for you. The route the game expects you to take is in Lavender, one of my favorite areas in the game. It has unique music that's very different from anywhere else, eerie and haunting, but also with a melodic side that helps center it with its primary landmark. The town has little going on besides it really, it's just a small town tucked in the mountain alongside a titanic graveyard known as Pokemon Tower. If you come here initially, you won't be able to see the wild encounters. They appear as generic ghosts, and this is also supposed to prevent you from completing it as a ghost guards the stairs on the penultimate floor. The Sylph Scope allows you to encounter these Pokemon, although there is a workaround that allows skipping the rocket hideouts. The dungeon itself is neat thematically, there's nothing like it anywhere else, <laughs> pretty much in the franchise, especially with how morbid it is. The bottom floor is filled with people weeping over their dead Pokemon, and the trainers are all channelers being possessed by ghosts. Halfway through, one of the channelers makes a white magic healing circle, which is really bizarre. It's just magic in the otherwise reasonably technology-focused and grounded world of Pokemon. It's admittedly a pretty basic dungeon. You walk through a bunch of tiny mazes and fight channelers who mostly use the same two Pokemon over and over, but it also starts with a rival fight who shows off part of his fun team building, giving himself a fire grass water core. He drops his Raticate, but maintains his starter Pidgeot and Kadabra, but depending on his starter will have two of Gyarados, Growlithe, or Execute that don't match his starter, running out his team really well. Gyarados is far and away the strongest of any of his potential Pokemon, meaning he's probably weakest with War Turtle. But when they evolve later, the other two aren't slouches either, both Arcanine and Executor. Pokemon Tower only has three Pokemon. Ghastly is by far the most common, but the other two become more common as you move towards the top. Ghastly's line is the only ghost line in the game, all also part poison, and it becomes Haunter at 25 and Gengar by trade. They're extremely fast and with high special, although Ghost is a physical type, not that it matters much, the only damaging move they have is Lick, which is pretty dreadful and doesn't hit Psychics regardless. And beyond that, there's Confuse Ray, which is a solid confusion move, and the line signature move Nightshade, which deals fixed damage based on that user's level. Ghost Poison is a solid type, regardless of how little it helps with offense, because both types are good defensively, and Gengar makes fantastic use of Gen 1 coverage. It is pretty reliant on TM, so it does kind of fall into a weird spot, and then you may want to spend that Thunderbolt on an actual electric and so on. But they are good to use. I really like Gengar. I'm sorry for talking about Gengar for so long. The other Pokemon available is Cubone. Rockets come through Lavender for rare Pokemon to sell and kill the Cubone's mother, which has caused them to congregate in the tower. Cubone is pure ground and evolves in a mirror at 28. Slow, decent attack, great defense. It's basically a slightly worse sand slash. Cool and red, where that's unavailable, but certainly not a better choice for the most part. It does have two signature moves to differentiate it, though. Bone Club, a mid-power ground move that can cause flinching, and Bone Meringue, which hits twice your 50, making it a slightly less accurate earthquake for whatever good that does, although it does get it a lot earlier than it would get earthquake. The ghost guarding the stairs is the Mother Marowak. It's only level 30, so it's very easy to deal with, but the message of it returning to the afterlife is nice. 
If you don't have the Sylph Scope, but you do have a Poké Doll, which lets you escape from any wild battle without fail, you can make the Marowak go away even if you can't see it, which bypasses needing to ever get the Sylph Scope. The bug reports that leaked a few years back indicate that this isn't a bug, but given that the remake fixes this, I think it's safe to conclude that Game Freak being lazy with the franchise isn't a new phenomenon. At the top, after a few rocket grunts, is Mr. Fuji, the kindly man who takes care of the orphan Pokemon Lavender, who gives Red the Poké Food as thanks for helping Marowak's spirit get to rest, which opens up pretty much the rest of the game. The Poké Food can be used to awaken the sleeping Pokemon. They're both the same Pokemon in Guard Route 16 Route 12, although despite the numbering, it's fairly apparent that the game expects you to take 16 from Celadon, given that if you go through 12, you'll end up getting the Super Red first, and it's much more challenging. I'll, I'll loop back to it, quite literally as they both go to the same place. You could take either route. They're both equally valid. The game expects you to go through Celadon. The sleeping Pokemon is Snorlax. It's a fixed encounter, so if you fail to catch either, it's gone forever. But you can easily save in front of it. There's, there's nothing stopping you. It's pure normal, and despite its slow speed, it does huge attack and is pretty mixed elsewhere, taking its giant survivability from its access to rest. This puts it in an odd spot. Its survivability is really good, and it can hit really, really hard with Body Slam and Earthquake, but it makes almost no use of the immense special coverage it gets. Regardless, it's fantastic competitively for its ability to take hits, even if it's not that spectacular in an actual playthrough of the game. Road 16 also includes Doduo, yet another normal flying type, that evolves at 31 into Dodria. It's better Fero that you get later. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. It's slightly faster and harder hitting. It gives Tri Attack, which is a funny move that's pretty strong. Route 17 is the cycling route. To access it, you need a bike. If you somehow missed it, you can either backtrack or just go along 12. There's no downside to doing so outside of missing on a couple trainer battles. Although cycling road is a really fun and unique set piece. Not pressing buttons causes you to be dragged downwards, which makes it feel like a slope even if there's nothing visually representing that. The bikers on the route are also, I think, distinct NPCs that don't appear anywhere else. Maybe one or two, but they use neat teams, primarily of poison and fighting types that don't show up elsewhere because they're bikers. There's not any new Pokemon here, so it kind of just leads down into Route 18, which is just a short route with a patch of grass off to the side, which introduces bird keepers who use, uh, birds. There is a trade in the Route 18 gate, but it's not possible to do it right now, so I'm going to ignore it for a minute. Fuchsia at the bottom of this set of routes is something of a tourist trap. The layout is pretty odd, as most of the town is dedicated to the Safari Zone and very little actual space for people to live. Outside of the Safari Zone is a small zoo with some Pokemon to be cocked at, including the fossil Pokemon that you didn't choose, which is a fun little detail wrapping around back to the uh, super nerd character you meet at the start of the game, and it also gives you access to the Pokedex entry for the one you didn't pick. There's also a visitor center and the Warden's House, which is one of the few spots people seem to live here. The good route is available with all two Pokemon it makes available. Poliwag is pure water, becomes Poliwhirl 25, Poliwrath by Waterstone, which gains fighting. It's definitely an oddity, all Poliwrath stats are pretty middling, leaning defensive. It has some interesting stuff, all the good water stuff, Psychic, the usual ice stuff, but also gets all the fighting TMs, meaning it has exactly one directly damaging fighting move, Submission by TM only. Goldina is pure water and becomes Seeking at 33. Pure water is a pretty abundant in options, which makes this competition tough, especially given the odd physical attack lean, which just facilitates a handful of mediocre normal moves. Their signature move, Waterfall, would become incredible later on, but here it lacks the flinch chance, so it's just worse surf in the town where you get surf. Poliwag also gives access to another Pokemon by trade all the way back in Cerulean. The Pokemon can trade a Poliwhirl for the game's only Jinx. I'm not gonna touch the racism thing, it's stupid. It's a Gyaru Yukiana. It, it was way too Japanese to come over to America gracefully, even though I love how Japanese-y the designs can be in this game, with various references to popular Japanese myths and legends. Given it's only available by trade, Jinx is stuck with the somewhat unfortunate name of Lola. It's better than the name they give it in Fire Red and Leaf Green. It's Ice Psychic, which is one of the only unfortunate Psychic combinations this generation, with, with two resistances, only to its own types, and the Ghost Immunity. Its speed and special are good, but everything else is pretty bad. It's a neat special attacker, it gets Stab Psychic and Ice Beam, which is enough to make it more than usable, and also has a signature sleep move called Lovely Kiss that's more accurate than most, but it's pretty frail, high risk, decent reward. Before the gym, I suppose I'll have to talk about the Safari Zone. Ugh. I think it's conceptually interesting. A lot of the stuff in the Safari Zone isn't found anywhere else, or is very rare elsewhere in Kanto. 
It's pretty heavily implied that Pokemon like Scyther, Pinsir, Tauros probably aren't native to Kanto and are imported from elsewhere. And it's kind of fun to think about where they originally came from. Hell, Sun and Moon outright confirms that Execute is native to a different region, Alola, which gives the area its own feel in regards to being a bit foreign and weird. The Savari Zone is tied to a weird navigation challenge? It's kind of a dungeon, but instead of puzzles or battles, it's trying to reach the furthest part of the Safari Zone in under 500 steps, at which point the Safari game ends, which provides access to two key items. The HM for Surf and the Gold Teeth, which can be given to the Warden and Fuchsia for the Strength HM, which honestly barely comes up in this game and is only necessary once. It's a very unique dungeon concept, not just for this game, but pretty much anywhere. The Safari technically does have an entry cost of 500 yen. It's hypothetically possible to permanently softlock the game if you fought every trainer, found every item, and hidden item, sold them all, and wasted all your money, but you'd have to be very, very stupid to put yourself in that situation. The Safari Zone also has unique mechanics tied to its encounters. Pokemon can't be battled, you instead have the option to toss a rock to increase catch rate but also flea chance, or bait to do the opposite. Honestly, the flea rates are so high that it's not even worth attempting to mess with this system, unfortunately, which kind of leads to just, which is a lot less appealing a thought when you have huge pains in the ass at 4% encounter rates. As for the many things available here, I'll start with Execute, which evolves into Executor by Leafstone, both are Grass Psychic. It's a genuinely horrible type, but Executor is so insanely good it doesn't matter. Its special is massive at 165, and besides speed, its other stats are really solid too. Its only real issue is its reliance on TMs, by level up it only gets a handful of status moves and basic physical moves including its signature barrage, which is a wimpy, normal multi-hit move. It also doesn't get many special moves. Psychic is fantastic and Mega Drain is pretty decent, but the big winner is just in survivability. It can be really, really tough to kill despite the typing, while dishing out just as much back off Psychic. It's not perfect, especially because you need to plan TM use around it, but it's really powerful if invested in. Rhyhorn is ground rock and evolves into Rhydon at 42. It's a grind, but Rhydon is also available later. Great defense and attack, terrible everywhere else, extremely unfortunate typing. Rhydon gets the same massive coverage as Nidoking, Surf, Thunderbolt, Ice Beam, it's really crazy, but doesn't use them particularly well even compared to Nidoking. Both because of bad special and speed, instead becomes a slow, risky, earthquaker, and rock slider. Chansey is a pure normal type and is found as a 1% encounter here. Given the pension stuff has for fleeing this area, I uh, don't recommend going for it here unless you plan on using it. Granted all that, Chansey is good, great special and nearly max HP. The thing is borderline unkillable as a special wall while being able to learn a pretty significant portion of the game's TMs, giving it fantastic special coverage to fight whatever comes at it. Kangaskhan is pure normal, it's all around decent save it's special, which makes it pretty vulnerable to any sort of special attack, while being incapable of using the nutty coverage all the Nidoking shaped Pokemon gets. Instead of basically relies on the two big normal staples. Weird normal type moves and Earthquake. Dizzy Punch is a cool signature move with a confusion chance, but honestly this very Safari Zone has something that completely decimates it in the same physical normal role. Before that though, Venomat, a really cute Pokemon if nothing else, which becomes Venomoth at 31, both sporting the unfortunate bug poison typing. It's a better Butterfree, uh, fast and good special, it has the same weird psychic coverage as Butterfree does, with a type that's moderately better, <laughs> but it also gets actual bug moves. It comes so late in the game that it's all but pointless for the most part, like you're not gonna shift over from Butterfree once you hit the Safari Zone, but... Well, I say there's Tauros, which is probably the best Pokemon in the game, barring two of the five legendaries. Great speed, it gives a fantastic critical hit rate, good attack and defense, and crucially, serviceable special for using Thunderbolt and Ice Beam. This thing is an absolute monster of a physical stab user, primarily Body Slam and Hyper Beam, but Earthquake never hurts either. It's immediately apparent at any time that this is basically the Pokemon, regardless of how late it comes. Although, like Execute, it's heavily reliant on having safe TMs for its use. Uh, it doesn't get body slam naturally. It's really, really good, dominating even. Uh, one of the big one of the big guys in the competitive. Uh, very fun to use. So, back to Fuchsia's Gym. Invisible Wall Maze is kind of a neat concept, but if you play on anything that has color, or even the Game Boy Pocket, the walls are slightly visible. None of the assholes in the gym got the message that it's a poison gym, like, yeah, Drowsy and Hypno have poison gas, but they aren't poison, they're psychic. They don't even really tie into the game's ninja theme. A House of Illusions led by the ninja Kogo who actually does use poison Pokemon. Two coughings, a wheezing, and a muck. The worst thing here is that the coughings use smokescreen to fluff your accuracy and the muck uses minimize to raise its evasion. Beyond that, they're pretty helpless, and the wheezing also has a 1 in 4 chance of using self-destruct to kill itself. Unless you're on your last Pokemon or in a solo run, it's a non-issue. And he's at worst a moderate step above Erica in difficulty. 
Defeating him also allows you to use Surf, though, which opens up what little is left of Kanto. That actually doesn't give us as titanically many Pokémon to find as you'd expect. There's only one Pokémon that's actually encounterable by Surf, and only on the sea routes. Inland Surf encounters weren't introduced until the last of the Generation 1 games, but became a staple after. The largest side area in the game is opened by Surf, accessed by Route 10's water, the Power Plant. The Power Plant is a fairly simple dungeon. It's barren and you wander around it towards the end, and as its name implies, it focuses on electric types. The one gimmick it has is that Voltorb and Electrodes disguise themselves as Pokeballs, serving as the equivalent of Mimics in games with more traditional fantasy settings. It's interesting to consider that you're probably supposed to think that Voltorb and Electrode have shrunk to item size, as the shrinking debate is a hot topic right now. It's also interesting that in blue at least, Raichu is available here. Games after this for a good while would outright make Pokemon Evolve by Stone only available through Evolution, including this game's remake. So it's weird to see that convention that was fairly established for a while didn't actually start here. Magnemite is my favorite design of the generation. The simplicity just speaks to me, although thanks to the lack of steel type, it's just a regular old electric. Which despite making it have less weaknesses, does give it far less resistances. At 30 it becomes Magneton, its special is great and its defense is good which makes it hard to kill, but with middling speed, its only offensive special moves being electric type. If you need something that does nothing but use a really strong Thunderbolt, it's a really good option, but it does virtually nothing beyond that. Number 1 in my heart, number uh, probably like 100 in usability. Exclusive to Red is Electabuzz, pure electric, its counterpart is in another dungeon. It's fast, has decent special and attack, but is moderately frail. It's another design I like a lot, and it does a bit more it can do than Magneton. It gets Psychic submission and uses normal moves a bit better, but it doesn't do that simple electric spam thing as well as Magneton does. It's a bit too average and all around in this game. All the way at the back of the dungeon is the game's first legendary, Zapdos. It's a Super Magneton, and a little more. Special just as high, very fast, and with decent stats elsewhere. It does the big zap thing that all the electrics do, but it also gets Drill Pack on top of that, which hits different things very, very hard, making it probably the only good mix attack in the game. To wrap up all the stuff on the other path, heading east from Fuchsia, Route 15 is the normal straightforward route that has Ditto. Pure normal and perhaps the most unusable Pokemon in the game, stats are all miserable 48s and its only move is Transform. It takes a turn to use it, which you will almost certainly be one shot at using Ditto, and if you somehow aren't, you're left with 5 PP and all moves on an exact copy of your opponent's Pokemon. They probably resist or are neutral to all their own moves, you're probably not in full health, and it's not even useful for breeding because breeding doesn't exist yet. Routes 14 and 13 aren't very interesting. They have the same Pokemon, give or take, and are loaded with trainers, which is great for experience, but there isn't a lot new. 13 is a small maze, but it's mostly just a good place to go for some relatively free experience. Route 12 is a little more unique than other routes in the game. It's a series of piers that hangs out over a small bay where various fishermen hang out, with their teams of only water Pokemon. The Super Rod is gifted by the final fishing brother and cracks the water type choices wide open. These encounter tables are shared in various spots, but I'll just work my way back a little bit. On Route 12 itself, there's Tentacruel, which is Water Poison, and becomes Tentacruel at 30, shockingly fast and with great special, although middling elsewhere. Tentacruel is a great choice for the usual water stuff, Water Ice, and the added coverage of Acid and Mega Drain is pretty unique as far as water type goes. It's not unique in that it does what every water type does, but it does it pretty solidly. Crab uses Pure Water and becomes Kingler at 28. It has good attack and defense with Miserable Special. Without physical water moves, even its own signature Crab Hammer, which has an increased crit chance. Kingler is mostly reliant on middling normal type attacks, and especially for the TMs that you'd normally give a water type like Ice Beam, these are pretty much better used elsewhere, leaving Kingler in a pretty sad state. Walking back, the Safari Zone has a few new Super Rod Pokémon, both of which can also be found elsewhere if you'd prefer. Psyduck is pure water despite its name and evolves into Golduck at 33. Even, but decent stats, Golduck is kind of an all-rounder. It gets confusion as a wimpy bit of coverage, but also gets some touches of physical stuff. Its biggest benefit is Amnesia. In later generations, this raises special defense, but since there's only one special stat here, you get the idea. It's potentially really, really strong with some setup, especially given the badge boost glitch, but it's reliant on setup to hit the levels of simpler Pokemon like Tentacruel. Slowpoke is properly water psychic, like Psyduck's name implies it should be, and becomes Slowbro at 37, making it one of the harder Pokemon to evolve. It's not all that hot in this generation, the defense is great, the special is pretty middling, and it's tied for the slowest fully evolved Pokemon. It's bulky, and both water and psychic are fantastic types with great hard-hitting moves, and it actually has some really neat coverage with like 
Fire Blast on a water type. Slowbro can also be traded away for the game's only Lickitung in the gate between Route 18 and 17. It's a slow defensive Pokemon with largely mediocre stats, like its fellow pure normal types. It gets a majority of TMs, but so do Chansey and Tauros. Moving forward to the first of the sea routes, Route 19, there's a few more Super Rod Pokemon before we turn around for a few more errands. Shelter is pure water, and upon exposure to a Water Stone becomes Cloyster, which gains the Ice type, which is on the better end of the Ice type combo, as sad as it is. Cloyster's defense is incredible, making it mostly unbreakable on that end, but it has good attack and decent special too. It gets Clamp, a signature trapping move, but more reasonably has the nice advantage of getting Stab on the typical Water Ice coverage. Horsey is pure water and becomes Seizure at 32, good special, good defense, decent speed. It's not very specialized, and the only thing separating it from the other water with ice coverage Pokemon is Smokescreen to lower opponent's accuracy. Star used pure water, but after evolving into Starmie with the Water Stone gains a Psychic type. This is one of the best non-legendaries in the game by far, very fast, great special, and decent elsewhere. Gets Stab on Surf, Psychic, and for whatever reason also gets Thunderbolt to go with its usual ice coverage the waters get. Combine that with about 1 in 4 crits from its massive speed and you have a Pokemon that absolutely decimates anything that falls apart to any of these 4 really powerful moves. To ignore the ocean for a minute, the next gym is in Saffron. Saffron is pretty huge, although there honestly isn't much to see outside of the two big landmarks. The first is the Fighting Dojo, which was the gym before the better, stronger gym moved in next door. After fighting through a few guys there, including the Master, who reappears in the Johto games as the guy who gives you a Tyro, the player is allowed to take either Hitmonlee or Hitmonchan for free. Like Eevee and the Fossils, the choice is once per game. In the next generation, these two are connected by a mutual pre-evolution, Tyrogue, but for now they're technically not evolutionarily related. Hitmonlee is pure fighting, its attack is great, and its speed is good enough, but it's pretty defenseless. It kinda does end up in the high risk, high reward category in that way, as it can hit hard, and whereas everything else is pretty reliant on the submission TM, Hitmonlee has of all things three signature moves. Jump Kick is powerful, but if it misses, it deals recoil. High Jump Kick is the same, but even more powerful. But oopsie, thanks to a glitch on miss, they only deal one damage, making the bigger risk that it'll be run over, thanks thanks to its frailty if it does miss. Rolling Kick is weaker, but has a higher crit rate, which means it's always gonna crit. It's definitely the fighting type that plays best into being a fighting type, but it's kind of a risky option just because it dies so quickly. Hitmonchan is bad. <laughs> It's also pure fighting, it has good attack, but it kinda evens out everything else. Slower, it's much more defensive, its biggest benefit is that it gets all the elemental punches, fire, ice, and thunder. All of these are calculated with special in this generation. Hitmonchan's special is one of the lowest in the game, which makes it worthless. Saffron also has the Sylph Company, the 11 floor tower that serves as the game's largest dungeon and probably the longest your first time through and shortest every time after. Each floor is packed with rockets who have taken the workers hostage and beyond using the stairs, can be navigated with teleporters that connect to each other all over the place. There's no way to check what floor you're on so it can be a little bit disorienting the first time, but if you know which teleporter is the important teleporter, as there is only one, uh, that gets you the key to unlock the gates, it can be completed in minutes. It's an interesting gimmick, but I feel like they may have gone a bit too far in that it's a very very tedious first trek through it, especially with the game's general low speed, and even worse if you're trying to clear out everything. It's especially bad that to actually get the key, you either need to go to the top and then teleport down to a floor you've been before and go the opposite direction or loop back through one. It's kind of a mess. I think it's neat conceptually and like the puzzle element of it is good, it's just far too much. Near the end, there's a rivalry match. Blue has evolved as Kadabra, Pidgeotto, and Starter, although Growlithe or Execute will not have evolved. And it's fairly high leveled and strong, although if you've been clearing trainers, you'd be pretty set for most of the game regardless. Giovanni, the head of Team Rocket, is also here, being the one behind the Sylph takeover, as he was looking for the Master Ball, which can catch anything. He maintains his Rhyhorn and Kangaskhan, which do mostly the same thing, but also has a Nidorino and Nidoqueen, the latter of which is his strongest Pokémon. It hits really hard with Body Slam, but most of its moves are pretty bad, even if its defensiveness can be kinda scary. Worker and Sylph Co. also gives you a Gift Lapras at a uh, level 15, and this late in the game, which makes it kinda unreasonable to train up. Regardless, it's Water Ice, and has decent stats everywhere besides HP, which is pretty great. It's a survivable tanky option for a Surf and Ice Beam spammer, and it gets Psychic and Thunderbolt, which is a great additional special coverage for it, but it's such a grind to catch up and so dependent on TMs that you may have already spent. Basically, it'd be really cool if you could get it an hour, two hours earlier. Now for the gym. The puzzle is a teleporter maze. It's pretty chaotic, but eventually you'll stumble through it. The best part of the puzzle is that it's a more dense reincorporation of the teleporters from Sylph, uh, arguably a much better <laughs> usage of them since you're in a more limited space. A bunch of the assholes here use Ghost, despite it being a psychic gym, but given that ghosts are otherwise all locked to one dungeon, I guess it's more understandable here than Koga's gym. Sabrina's team is easily the most threatening in the game of any gym leader. The psychic type is really really good, and she has a Kadabra, Alakazam, and Mr. Mime, plus a uh, Venomoth for some reason. But the type has pretty much no weaknesses, and Alakazam especially just wicks off any kind of special damage, made better by having Recover. 
before the end game, it's easily the most difficult fight, save for maybe Charmander on Misty, but those crumple a bit to any solid physical attacks. There are two avenues that lead to the next gym, either through the ocean south of Fuchsia or south of Pallet. The game clearly intends you to take the former, and as such, I'll just follow that line. Sea routes aren't very interesting. The only surf encounter in the game is Tentacool. There's no puzzles or any real interaction at all. You move in the one direction that the route flows, fight trainers if you want, but always have enough room to go around them, and if you do fight, they all use nothing but water types. Route 19 and 20 deviate very little from this formula, but 20 is broken up by the Seafoam Islands. This dungeon is optional. You can just go down from Pallet, but it's the more interesting route and has stuff to find. To cross through Seafoam, the lowest floor needs to have its water flow blocked off. This is accomplished with one of two strength uses in the game, and the only good one. Around the upper floors are boulders to push with strength, and holes to push them through. The goal is to get them to the lower floors, where they'll block the water flow. A little more complicated that's used in order to access a Pokemon. Well, not new, there's some kind of cool stuff mixed in. Slowbro, Kingler, and Seedra. But there's a few things that are also found only in Seafoam. Both Seal and its evolution Dugong. Seal's pure water, Dugong gains ice. And the evolution happens at 34. Saw it all around her. Good special for the usual water and ice thing. On the bottom floor, beyond its own strength puzzle, is Articuno. The second of the legendary birds. Ice flying. A pretty, uh... Rocky type. Great special, decent everywhere else. It gets virtually nothing beyond Ice Beam and Blizzard. It doesn't use its meager flying selection like Fly and uh, Peck particularly well. It's very good at one singular thing, but that same thing can be done by pretty much every water type on top of doing slightly more with water. It kind of just has the Magneton problem in that it's really, really good at one thing and otherwise has nothing else to do. Cinnabar Island is based on Izu Ushima, primarily notable for being a small inhabited volcanic island just like Cinnabar. Someone like Game Freak must have had an X there if they blew it up next generation. The volcano is sadly not an element that can be interacted with in any way, as cool as it would be, but the quiet little town has some neat stuff. The Pokemon Lab is a small research facility that can be used to revive fossils and has a few trades, all of which are for Pokemon that can otherwise be found elsewhere. Seal, Electrode, and Tangela, although this is the first place to talk about Tangela. Tango is very slow, defensively it's good, special's good, but it's so slow, while also missing out on Grass's most usable move, Razor Leaf, and having to rely on Mega Drain and Solar Beam. It relies on trapping moves like Rap mostly, which can be really broken in this game, but at this speed it's gonna have an issue sticking those trapping moves. As for the fossils, you either get the Helix or Dome and Mount Moon, as I said before, so catching them all is made kinda awful by these, since you're gonna have to find someone who's willing to give you the other one unevolved so that you can evolve it. The Old Amber is in the museum side entrance. The Helix fossil can be revived into Ammonite, which becomes Amistar at 40. With both are rock water, great defense, great special, but slow with low attack, even if it got any rock moves, which it doesn't, it wouldn't use them very well. So it kinda just falls down to being a decently defensive water, doing the same thing that every other water does. It's okay, but the water type competition is very insane in this game, and pretty Pretty much all of them. From the dome fossils, Kabuto, who also evolves at 40 into Kabutops, and is also rock water. It's a bit more balanced, good attack and defense, but also decent speed. It's in the slightly unfortunate position where it's reliant on slash and submission without getting much more to actually use its physical stat on. Not even rock slide and being pretty weak with the usual water stuff. The old amber arrives into Aerodactyl, rock flying, who thankfully for a one-off does not evolve. Incredibly fast and with good attack, Aerodactyl is a crit monster only really held back by the lack of rock moves in the game. It does fly well, it does hyper beam well, but it lacks any good way to take advantage of its rock type, while also being a fairly vulnerable type that would like to have good stab endings quickly. The island also has its own dungeon, the Pokemon Mansion. The ruins of an old mansion that was formerly a secret laboratory, but it was destroyed in a fire. Scattered around the lab are some of the most interesting bits of story in the game. Journal entries which detail the creation of Mewtwo from recovered Mew DNA, who may or may not have been the one to destroy the mansion. It's pretty heavily implied that it was Mewtwo, but... The mansion is fairly small, centering itself around a handful of basic when you open one gate another gate closes puzzles that never get too difficult or interesting, but are enough to keep things at least moderately engaging. And the key to the locked gym is at the far end of the dungeon. Most of the game's fire and poison types are here, which makes them pretty difficult to use in game given the uh, proximity to the game ending. Ponyta is pure fire and becomes Rapidash at 40. Save Dratini, it's the biggest pain in the ass to train, especially because it comes so late. Rapidash is a fast physical attacker that only gets normal and fire moves by level up. If you want something to use, non-stab stomp moderately well, this is your Pokemon. 
Grimer's Pure Poison becomes Mach at 38. While not exclusive to blue, it's much more common in that game. Muck is solidly bulky and has great attack, but Poison is a pretty barren type. It's the best sludge user in the game and can kinda sit on Toxic, but it's mostly reliant on mediocre normal moves, unless you want to invest the good TMs into it. On the reverse side, Coughing is far more common in red, but is still in blue and becomes Wheezing at 35. Both Pure Poison, and while slow, it has great defense on a type that's already very defensive, plus decent attack and special, which can make it both hard to kill and fairly strong using Sludge, its weird Thunderbolt and Fire Blast coverage, and of course Explosion, which is limited in-game as it knocks it out, but it is very solid on it. Weezing is the better of the two, but like Mach requires way too much investment way too late in the game to be kind of reasonable to use. Finally, Electabuzz's blue exclusive counterpart shoves so late in the game to be completely unusable, Magmar. Pure Fire, it's decently fast, has good attack, but its special is just passable. It uses fire moves well enough, it uses normal moves well, but relies on TMs too much. Also, its Japanese name is Booper, but it's hard to justify training any Pokemon that you get this late in the game. Blaine's Gym has a fun gimmick. Doors in the gym can either be opened by answering a trivia question, general Pokemon stuff like the number of badges, or fighting the train. Although even if you get the question right, you can still challenge the trainer if you want the experience. Blaine is in a bad spot. In order to reach Cinnabar, you need Surf, which means walking into the fire gym. He had a pretty huge advantage off the bat. His Growlithe and Ponyta suck, his Rapid Ash is fast enough to be kind of threatening, but doesn't do much beyond Fire Spin Trapping Spam. And if you get out of that, he's done, and Arcanine is actually decently threatening to deal with beyond the whole, uh you basically being guaranteed to have a good water type thing. Between Cinnabar and Pallet is Route 21, it's a sea route that has some islands with fishermen. Tangla is found in the grass on the route, but it do be a sea route, you just sail north. That leaves the only remaining gym, which is Viridian. The gym is a small maze loaded with trainers that incorporate the spinners from the Team Rocket hideout under the game corner. A nice little hint as what lies ahead, as the gym leader is none other than Giovanni, the ground leader. No one in this gym actually follows the ground type theming, uh, they all use Machoke, Tauros, etc. Fighting types. Giovanni's Dugtrio is great, Nidoqueen is great, Nidoking is great, Rhydon is great. Surf is a thorn in the gym's side, but he's using Pokemon that are all at the very least good, and I really like the twist. Giovanni being a gym leader is just such an odd way to have him come back. He's the leader of the Yakuza, but he seems to also love Pokemon and battling, so he holds the position for that reason. It's not something you'd really expect walking into it, although I think him deciding to uh, disband Team Rocket and dedicate himself to studying Pokemon out of respect for your skills a bit sudden a turn for someone implied to be so ruthless, still. It's a cute ending to the Rocket storyline, which otherwise kind of just hung after Sylph. Pick up on the storyline in Gen 2 to an extent. With that, it's time for the Pokemon League, but first, the final fight against Blue. His team is the exact same as the previous fight, but he adds in a Rhyhorn that does less than nothing for him. His team comp is cool, but you're pretty well guaranteed to overlevel him pretty strongly here, and with that, he's off to the League, and so are you. Row 23 is fun, I like having to pass all the different gates and get checked. It makes the build up really great, and there's some neat stuff here if you care, Slowbro, Kingler, Arbok, Sandslash, but just serves to hype up the final dungeon, Victory Road. Victory Road is not very good. It's too long and the only thing to do besides fight strong Pokemon like Machoke and Graveler, and a small spattering of trainers, is to deal with bad strength puzzles. Not bad because they're strength puzzles, I, I really enjoy strength puzzles, and I think the one in Seafoam is pretty clever, but bad because the boulders are always stupidly far away from where they need to be, making the very easy puzzles very, very tedious when they didn't need to be. Victory Road also contains Moltres, the last of Legendary Birds, Fire Flying, which not that bad of a type yet, but way worse later on in the series. Good speed, Titanic Special, decent elsewhere. It's Super Charizard, and it lands decent hits with flying moves that it actually gets, unlike Charizard, but lacks fire moves. No flamethrower, just spin by default and blast by TM, and it does very little else. It's okay, but not really worth training up, given that the final challenge of the game is 10 minutes away, and that it lacks flamethrower and has to deal with the wildly inaccurate other fire moves. Moltres has always felt kind of weird being in Victory Road since, um, you feel like he'd be in the Volcano Islands, and he's just kind of shoved in the middle of Victory Road. All you have to do is just go down a certain ladder, and Moltres is sitting there. You'd think there'd be, like, a thing with the volcano, and maybe at one point that was the plan, and it just fell through, so they stuck him wherever they could fit him. <laughs> I don't know. To speak on the Elite Four, they, uh, aren't well designed, mostly. The teams are really something, usually, and about half of them use good AI, that is to say they'll attempt to use a super effective move every turn if possible, including status moves, which is most exploitable on Lorelei, the first of the Elite Four. Her Dugong has Rest, which is Psychic type. If you send out a Poison type, she'll just rest over and over while you set up and sweep. For an Ice-type trainer, she sure do have a Slowbro, too. 
She actually is threatening because of her Lapras, which has Body Slam, and to be fair, she has a good variety of the Scant Ice type, but I don't know if I could call her good when she's so exploitable. Jinx is cool, Lapras is cool, Cloyster is very cool, but she does not put up much of a fight if you know how to exploit her. Bruno sucks. <laughs> He has two Onyxes, which are not fighting type, or even remotely similar to the fighting type. But Champ is okay, hits hard. Hitmonlee is okay, hits hard. Hitmonchan is not good at all. There's always the chance that Hitmonchan fucks you up with a lucky freeze. Not very likely. His Machamp and Hitmonlee both have the non-functional focus energy. Any specially focused Pokemon bowls over his team in seconds. Um, Agatha is the only competent member of the Elite Four, and I like that she reminisces about her time hanging out with Oak when they were young. It's neat to consider that people in this world have lives outside of what we see, even if we don't get to see a lot of it because of the limitations of the Game Boy. Agatha is a Ghost-type trainer. It's hard to fault her for supplementing her team beyond two Gengar and a Haunter with a Golbat and Arbok, but doesn't that just make her a Poison trainer? Regardless, her Gengar and Haunter can be huge run killers. Confused Rain Nightshade and Toxic, on top of potentially Hypnosis and Dream Eater spam, makes her one of the only members of the Elite Four to potentially be a Devastator based sheerly on luck. Unless you outspeed and one-shot everything she has, you're gonna walk away having taken some kind of beating or status. Especially if you just get super unlucky on Hypnosis spins and get Dream Ate to death and Nightshade to death. She's even one of the very few trainers in the game who can on a whim decide to change Pokemon, keeping her pretty unpredictable and threatening, like when you try to use Earthquake on her Gengar, she switches into Golbat, and then you're just fucked. The champion of Elite Four is Lance. You probably remember him from the Gold and Silver video. He has no presence in this game, but he looks cool. His team is moderately more Dragon than in Gen 2, but that says little when he has two Dragonair, a Dragonite, Gyarados, and Aerodactyl. I can let Gyarados slide because it's got Dragon energy, but Aerodactyl is just a fucking dinosaur. His strategy is to try to one-shot you with Hyper Beam so he can keep one-shotting you. That's it. And to his credit, it can work really well. Although, if you can survive the first Gyarados' Hyper Beam and set up, you're pretty home free, especially if you have Ice Beam. Uh, now for the twists. I mean, everyone knows about it by now, but it's a fun twist, yeah? It's the only time the Elite Four having four members has ever made sense. Lance is the head of the four, and Blue, your rival, just happened to beat you to the punch, leading to one final battle to settle things. It's a fun twist that actually bothers to explain why you have five fights, where every time after this you just fight five guys in the Elite Four. <laughs> Blue's team hasn't changed, but his Arcanine and Execute will have evolved. He's actually a huge pushover compared to Lance and Agatha, which is kind of sad. Executor only has three moves. Rhydon's only attacking move is Fury Attack. Pidgeot likes to try to use Sky Attack, which leaves it wide open during its charge turn. His starter and Alkazam are the only two that are threatening, but most of his movesets are pretty fucking rough. I don't really understand Oak's conclusion at the end that Blue lost for not caring about his Pokemon enough when there really was not an indication of that. He seemed like a fine trainer. I'm not sure where that concept came from. Uh, it's kind of rude of him to say that. Yeah, that, that wraps up the main game. Post-game is an odd subject for Pokemon. So many people bitch about post-game, but the games already have dex completion as a huge post-game task. I know they want more stuff like Kanto in the Johto games, but I don't mind something simple. In Red and Blue, there's an extra dungeon in the post-game, Cerulean Cave. You can probably figure out where that's located by yourself. For a post-game dungeon, it actually doesn't have much going on. You'd expect strength puzzles or something, but the entire maze on the top floor is just a distraction for items. You walk through the pretty barren middle floor to the basement, where you surf to the end, and with no surf encounters, it feels a little anticlimactic. Don't get me wrong, the Pokemon selection is cool. Raichu and Wigglytuff especially, given that they're stone evolutions, but also Chansey, Marowak, Rhydon but it doesn't make it all that fun to navigate. At the end is Mewtwo, the final Pokemon available in the game. It's a shame he's the best Master Ball target in the game, which means most people will just never fight him, because being at level 70 and having recover makes it a real intense fight and catch. Although the fact that he has no limit to his PP and can just continue to recover forever, the intenseness kind of slides into stupidity at some point. Regardless, Mewtwo is the most broken thing in the game, bar none. It has the highest stats, the highest special, psychic type, obscenely fast, and with decent stats and everything else. Mewtwo is an unstoppable monster that can recover away any damage it does take, shoot out unsurvivable psychics to one-shot anything in the game, and learns most TMs, meaning you can make all kinds of sets with it. Pretty much the only issue is that it comes as the last thing in the game. It isn't useful for catching stuff for dex completion because it's so absurdly powerful, meaning it really only has use in player versus player, and nobody, nobody wants to play Gen 1 PvP, eh? Before I spend a long time talking about the half dozen mangas Red and Blue spawned, I should touch on Mew, the first event legendary in the series. It was included last minute at high risk of causing even more bugs. Uh, imagine that. 
It was a pretty guarded secret, although rumor of its existence fueled speculation, which drove hype. Apparently, there was designers who went around telling people about <laughs> about Mew to drive up the hype and build speculation. Uh, it's not that Nintendo never knew Mew existed, it's that they didn't know Mew was in the game. Mew was an enduring mystery for people playing the game, mentioned in the lore but not found anywhere, which led to theories and hunts and searching that incidentally gave the game a ton of extra life. People love a good mystery, they love looking under the truck, running around a pole a thousand times in Super Mario 64. If you have something that is just mysterious and weird, people will be drawn to it and try to solve it. Mew has 100 in all stats, is pure psychic, and learns every TM and HM to tie into its lore being the first Pokemon, ancestor of all the others basically. Uh, besides Mewtwo, it's the only banned Pokemon in competitive. It can make literally any set work, gets stab on Psychic. Of course, it's great. Now, let's talk about a lot of manga. Pokemon Special, called in some localizations Pokemon Adventures, is fantastic. I spoke quite a bit in my Gold, Silver, Crystal, and Heart, Gold, and Soul, Silver videos about those segments of the manga, but from the start, the series was fantastic. The red, green, and blue chapter definitely stays closer to the games than the adaptation of the next generation, although some strong liberties are still taken. The rockets are definitely played more evil. Beyond creating Mewtwo, they perform experiments on other Pokemon, turning them evil, making Eevee fluctuate between its evolutions, fusing legendary birds, and are also quite murderous, attempting to kill the protagonist very often. And Three of the gym leaders, Serge, Koga, and Sabrina, work with them. The protagonists are good, Red is generally the main character, he's kind of rash, but Green appears fairly often, serving as a foil to him, cold and calm, although in their various occasional encounters, they rub off on each other quite a bit, with Blue becoming kinder and more open through learning to bond with Pokemon from Red, while Red becomes stronger through controlling his emotions. Blue's pretty secondary. She's a thief who messes with the other two, but despite that, she's cool deep down, and the end of the story hints at some of her trauma and future events that tie into the gold silver crystal arc. The big attractions here are the art, which all has a nice soft style to it, with slightly chibi characters, although villains tend to be sharper and more detailed, both really striking and strong action too. Pokemon are very detailed and accurate to their official art, and the action is very creative. Battles are very non-linear and toss out the game rules a lot, but the dynamicism is worth it. Constant movement, weird and interesting strategies, from creating indoor storm clouds to turning a horde of wild victory bell against a giant Nido King. The manga never lets you catch a breath, it's great. This arc especially is extremely violent. Corpses possessed by Ghastly that fall to bits when attacked. Koga's Arbok getting decapitated, although canonically it survives this somehow. <laughs> Giovanni kills some Magmar. The brutality would be turned down quite a bit in later arcs, but it's certainly a interesting mood for this section of the manga and kind of helps raise the stakes to an extent. It feels a lot like the creative team played the games and let their imaginations run wild in filling the blanks of what happened in the very limited story of this game, which is something I love about the limited story format of the early games. You fill in the story you make with your own Pokemon. I actually don't have a lot more to say on this arc, I think it's a nice simple story. It mainly revolves around Monster of the Week type stories, although the rockets are the main part of the overlying plots. The art and action are great, and I love seeing Pokemon flush out well in ways the games couldn't. Pokemon Zen Show seems to be untranslated, save for the first chapter, or I just couldn't find anything after that. It seems to be a very direct adaptation of the games following the basic gym journey, being a lot less thought out than adventures. From the one chapter I read, it seems to be pretty goofy and calm, although I don't like the art style at all, and the action seems pretty weak. Alright, that was easy. Now for Pokemon Pocket Monsters, which is also almost entirely untranslated, despite being the longest running Pokemon manga and being very popular in Japan, as I understand it. The series is far less serious than the others, primarily playing as a gag manga for comedy, to giggle at the absurdity of Pokemon and using a goofy art style and huge deviations from the canon, like talking Pokemon to deliver jokes. I genuinely have no idea what to make of this shit, and that's coming from the perspective of someone that had actually made laugh a few times. The fire extinguisher joke, where Clefairy starts smashing Labble on fire? Pretty gold. The art style is bizarre, everything is very exaggerated, and virtually nothing is on model. I can't say it's good, but it's an interesting style. Clefairy is a fun choice for a main Pokemon, as it was originally pegged as the series' mascot before going with Pikachu, primarily because Clefairy was cute but not cool, and the incompetence of Red and Clefairy is fun sometimes, but the joke gets old pretty fast. I only read the few chapters that were available on Mangadex, but it definitely feels a bit below what I'm looking for. Something funny, but mostly just kind of strange. To touch briefly on the anime, Pokemon Origins is nice if a bit odd. It pretty directly adapts Red and Blue, although at a very brisk pace, although given it came out in 2016, it also incorporates some elements more akin to later games, designs closer to the original sets of remakes, as well as trying to fit Megas into the final act, which, uh, I don't know, but it does use menus and renditions of the music, most akin to Red and Blue, so I guess I'll throw it in here. 
A lot of the plot of the game is skimmed over, covering Brock in Episode 1, Lavender Town in 2, Rock and Giovanni in 3, and Blue and Mewtwo in 4, while briefly montaging everything else. It primarily focuses on really strong, well-made action scenes, which are very high-paced and energetic. Despite how narrow the selection of set pieces is, they show off a good amount of Pokémon, although the Charizard pandering is pretty, <laughs> pretty heavy. As a retelling of the game, it's serviceable primarily in fleshing out Giovanni some, how much of himself he sees in red, especially, although the series really mostly is just a cool action showcase. At four episodes, it's a pretty short watch, and enjoyable as it is, just a nice little action show that's produced in a much nicer way than the main Pokémon show is. Definitely a worthwhile watch. A brief shout out to my teams before I wrap this up. Rad I use Charizard, Needle King, Fear, Eradicate, Gyarados, and Hypno. This is a pretty undeep, use whatever I find type team. As you can probably see from mostly using stuff from the early game. Charizard did Fire Moves and Slash. Fear and Eradicate were both hard neutral hitters off normal moves and flying for Fearow. Hypno used Psychic Direction and Hypnosis for catching. Needle King pretty much spammed Earthquake but had Thunderbolt because uh, nothing else could learn it. And Gyarados was the surfer, as well as just the general. He, he, hit, he hit hard. As for Blue, I tried to get a bit more creative. Blastoise, Sandslash, Farfetch, Clefable, Victory Bell, and Magneton. Everyone here is fairly obvious. Blastoise was the big surfy dude plus Ice Beam. Sandslash was Earthquake and Slash Spam. Farfetch is the flyer, but also a bit of a crit monster with Slash itself. Victory Bell was support and catching with Wrap and Sleep Powder. Magneton used powerful Thunderbolts, and Clefable Spam Body Slam and had a bit of coverage from the special moves as it does. It's hard not to call Red and Blue somewhat badly made games. They're objectively barely functioning at any given time, but I think that's got a charm. Knowing that the level of polish very quickly moved beyond this also helps, but it's neat to take advantage of the weirdness. Badge boosts make bad Pokemon with any access to boosting usable, the Mew glitch has all sorts of wacky effects, and while I didn't experiment with it too much, the glitch Pokemon are fascinating. Hell, you can even shiny own this game because IVs determine shininess in Gen 1, which is just a fascinating twist of fate. In the VC versions, you can transfer shiny Mewtwo's up to Gen 7. Kanto is great in a way that feels... real. It's very homey, quiet, and calm. It's got exaggerated features and interesting places, but largely it feels like a place most people have lived at some point. It's just a bit more magical. The simple story puts the emphasis on your own story, your imagination of what your adventures are like, and how your Pokémon act, and the non-linearity after the early game gives you a lot of freedom to mess around, get Pokémon early, and even just play to your strengths, and the gates that block your progress have interesting, if occasionally, badly telegraphed solutions. Somehow, this game is nearly perfectly balanced. By beating every trainer as you go, you'll always be give or take five levels from each gym leader, which is almost certainly just due to the abundance of trainers, but feels really nice. There's some definite issues. <laughs> There's, there's a lot of issues, actually. Some. Crits being tied to speed places an even higher emphasis on that stat than later games do, making fast things superior in pretty much every scenario. Battles lack complexity on a lot of levels, especially because of all the alternate strategies that came later with weather and abilities and stuff. Dungeons lack interesting designs in most scenarios, with Seafoam and Sylph being the only ones to stand out for puzzles. The PC is absolutely miserable to use because there's no move function. And the item limits in the bag and PC are simply frustrating. But I think the games are fun, warts and all, sometimes despite them and sometimes for them. Being broken is a standout trait that nothing else in the series can really say the same about. There's definitely value in giving these a try. They're slow, they're janky, but they're comfy, funny, and for how boring it is on the surface, Kanto is kind of a special place. Pokemon Yellow Version, Special Pikachu Edition, or a uh, Yellow as most call it, is the third version for Gen 1, and at the time, not overdone, novel concept to more highly remix the games, and as such, is far and away the most different of any third version in the series. Yellow would launch in 1998 in Japan, right as the rest of the world got the first set of the games, and would spread to the globe in 1999, which like Red and Blue also eventually came to the 3DS. Unlike the complex and difficult task of creating Red and Blue, and its arguably even more troubled sequels, Gold and Silver, Yellow served as something of a momentum retainer, serving to buy some time for Generation 2, also serving to test some ideas and mechanics. It's also worth noting that early in its development, according to leaked files, Yellow was to have its own counterpart, Pink, which, speculative on my part, 
probably would have starred Clary, who was originally intended to be the series' mascot, and starred in some manga and offshoot material, although the team may have rightfully decided that releasing the same game five times was pushing their luck. Of the traditional third versions, I phrase it like that due to the interesting case of Black 2 and White 2, it was probably the most different. Consider Crystal, which I talked about last time. A few exclusions, a few changes to routes, mainly in the early game, Suicune is no longer a roamer, you're forced to go to Burn Tower, and a mediocre battle tower as a post-game. Largely, you get the same experience going through the game, but Yellow has a few big shakeups that change things pretty substantially, primarily in the starter, Pikachu. Pikachu is kind of a prototype for the different forms that would come later in the series, despite by all means being a regular Pikachu. If you trade it into another game, it just becomes a standard Pikachu. It's treated pretty differently while in Yellow, most obviously. Pikachu hates Pokeballs and follows the player around, and can be talked to to get a cute reaction from it. The system doesn't really do anything, but it's a cute thing that you can do, talk to Pikachu. The reaction it gives is tied to an early version of the friendship system that will become standard in the series in Generation 2. Here its only effect is on obtaining one gift Pokemon and making Pikachu's reactions happier, which is adorable but doesn't do anything for the actual gameplay side of things. Beyond that, Pikachu's cry is also replaced with a horrifically bit-crushed version of its anime cry. It sounds genuinely awful, but the attempt was there. Yellow is very closely tied into the anime, retrofitting a lot of elements of red and blue into anime references. Pikachu is a pretty bad starter, honestly. Granted, you can abandon it if you want, but the game loses a lot of what makes it special if you do. It's unevolved and rocks the meager stats of a standard Pikachu, barely edging out the base forms of the standard starters, and falling off very quickly. By Gym 2, when the standard starters are hitting Stage 2, they'll have about 60 base stat total on top of Pikachu, and are about 150 above at Stage 3. If Pikachu could evolve, it'd be serviceable, but he refuses, meaning it just becomes more and more of an uphill battle as the game progresses. Pikachu's moveset also leaves a lot to be desired, even with its enhanced moveset in yellow, it almost exclusively gets electric and normal moves, with its only other choice being submission by TM fairly late in the game, which is a risky move that's better spent elsewhere regardless. If you transfer it to Pokemon Stadium, it also gets Surf, which is an interesting gimmick, but again, probably not optimal. Granted, it's not all terrible. In yellow, Double Team was added to its moveset, which thanks to the badge boost glitch is an Omni boost with evasion, <laughs> although it's pretty gimmicky and definitely abusing broken mechanics. Pikachu is also a Pokemon that gets the maximum pretty quick. The optimal Pikachu moveset, with little variance, is Thunderbolt, Double Team, Body Slam, and Thunder Wave for catching. All of which you'll have by the time you reach the halfway point at the latest. Thunderbolt you get from Gym 3, Body Slam you get from the SSN right before Gym 3, Double Team you get at like 15, and Thunder Wave at like 20 or something. Once you hit that halfway point, you have the optimal Pikachu. Pikachu kind of just slowly gets more and more of class as the Pokemon opponents use improve. To briefly touch on this game's exclusions, while I'd prefer they weren't there, I do think it's cute that they follow a theme, largely excluding Pokemon typically associated with Team Rocket. The Weedle line, whose absence makes the early game a little easier. The Ekans line, which means it's only available through Red. Raichu, as well as the standard Pikachu, for obvious reasons. Meowth's line, meaning it's only available through Blue. Coughing's line, completing the Rocket Trio alongside Ekans and Meowth. Jinx, which is actually a huge headache, as it's only available as a one-off trade in Red and Blue, leading to being an obnoxious kink in a living dex. Electabuzz, only found in red, and Magmar only found in blue, which is sad as I love the Yokai trio, and getting both Scyther and Pinsir isn't a great trade-off when they're functionally pretty similar, and their absence hurts the availability of fire types and electric types especially. Well, I guess losing two of the game's shallow set of poison lines is a big hit for that type too. The divide also requires you to use both of the other games to fill the decks, which wasn't the case for the original two games, which is a mild annoyance for me as well, as red and blue can be completed with just red and blue, yellow requires all three, Lots of small changes have been made to availability and movesets otherwise, most famously the Route 22 Mankey before Brock, as well as giving the Nidoran's double kick at fairly low levels. The Pokemon before Brock all had a pretty rough time against him, and Pikachu especially struggles, with both of his Pokemon immune to its Thundershock and heavily resisting its normal moves if they're grinded for, especially given Geodude and Onyx's high defense. To get past this with just Pikachu would take a lot of work to say the least, so an early fighting type is a big benefit, or an early fighting type move. All three starters are available as gift Pokemon throughout the game, matching the anime. Bulbasaur and Cerulean, but requiring Pikachu to be at a certain happiness, you'll usually right after Gym 3, so as you're passing back through Cerulean you'll probably be able to pick up Bulbasaur. Charmander on Route 25, just north of Cerulean, and Squirtle and Vermilion after beating Surge. These three very highly compensate for Pikachu's shortcomings, all being good on their own, but it does feel a bit overpowered. Anything for anime references, I guess. But it's a neat feature over Red and Blue that makes the game even more distinct. 
As for some other notable examples, Venonat is found on Route 24, which makes it much more usable as you get it at a decent time. Pidgeotto can be found underleveled in Verdian Forest, which is kind of interesting. Um, I assume it's there to replace Weedle, which wasn't there. The Power Plant gives access to Grimer and Muck a bit early, as does Ponyta on Cycling Road, and the Safari Zone has Dragonair through fishing. The game has a lot of 1% encounters, which is a touch irritating, but the earlier access to some of this stuff is a nice benefit. There's also some other oddities, for better and for worse. Farfetch is no longer limited to trade, freeing it of being named Ducks and letting you farm out multiple on Route 13, which is the same for Lickitung, although it's only in Cerulean Cave in the postgame, and you can even get him a champ by trading for a Cubone in the Underground Path, opening access for lonely players to use at least one trade evolution in the game. On the more negative side, Vulpix can only be obtained in the game corner, adding another exclusive there alongside Porygon, Oh, there's no Pokemon exclusive to in-game trades, which is kind of appreciable. Charizard also gets Fly, which is... It's ridiculous that he didn't get it before, uh, but it is a nice little benefit for Charizard. A lot has changed for trainers too, most notably Blue's team is fully overhauled. Blue begins with an Eevee, which he can evolve in any of its evolutions based on the outcome of the first battle, and the battle on 22 has a difficulty slider of sorts. Winning both battles causes Blue to choose Jolteon, presumably inspired by your Pikachu, which causes it to resist your moves. Winning one of the battles but losing the other, or skipping the fight on 22 after winning the first gives him Flareon, which is Dundra to Pikachu, and losing both, or losing the first and skipping the 22 battle gives him Vaporeon, which is weak to Pikachu's attack, which is a neat dynamic. While the first battle especially is very luck based, largely depending on how aggressive Blue is, if either side gets a crit, and the DVs of your Pikachu, making it a bit of a coin flip. To fill out the rest of the team, instead of Pidgey, he takes Spearow, which evolves into the generally much stronger Fero, although like his Rattata, he eventually drops this. Sandshrew, for the obvious reason that it trashes Pikachu. Alakazam and Executor, who are both really powerful psychics, are on his endgame team when Fero and Rattata get dropped. Then to fill in the types for the EV evolutions that he didn't take, with other things to form a Fire, Water, Electric core. Cloyster replaced Vaporeon, which is an awesome pick. Ninetales replaced Flareon, and Magneton replaced Jolteon. It doesn't hurt the movesets for trainers are much improved, no longer using the default movesets, but incorporating TM moves and the like, which is especially noticeable when you get to late game opponents like Lance, whose Dragonair and Dragonite have some wild coverage, like Ice Beat. There's also something of a secondary rival, or set of rivals, in the Team Rocket trio, Jesse James and Meowth ripped from the anime, who appear anywhere Rockets do normally, first being fought in Mount Moon, then Rocket Hideout, Pokemon Tower, and finally Silphco, utilizing Meowth, which they never evolved, as well as Ekans and Coughing, which they do evolve. For the most part, they tend to replace a few generic grunts, but honestly, after Mount Moon, they tend to be incredibly easy and are kind of jokes, which I guess is in character for their anime counterparts. Gym leaders also have various changes to better match their anime counterparts. Most notably, Surge's only Pokemon is a singular high-leveled Raichu. Koga's team is comprised of three Venonat and a Venomoth. Sabrina has one of each member of Abra's evolution line, and Giovanni uses Persian before his gym battle, which is a great choice for him. Plus, in Blaine's gym, you're actually required to attempt the quizzes instead of just fighting through. I'm guessing a lot of people did not realize that there are quizzes at all, because the computers you answer the questions on are like the 1960s giant wheel computers. The level curve is honestly kind of strange. Erika's Pokemon are in the mid-30s, but Koga's are mid-40s and up to 50 with Venomoth shortly after. Sabrina's Pokemon are all 50, Blaine's are mid-50s, Giovanni's are mid-50s, but the rival battles around these are still in the high 30s and low 40s, and the Elite Four have the same teams at the same 50s to 60 levels, although with much stronger movesets. The jump in level is pretty harsh, although I imagine that's from anticipation of people using all three starters, which are pretty damn strong, but it is a bit jarring compared to how smooth Red and Blue felt. A few other minor changes can be found throughout too. The Safari Zone softlock is fixed. If you have no money, you can enter and be given one Safari Zone, which prevents you from missing out on Surf. The catching tutorial in Viridian is now mandatory even if you have caught a Pokemon, which is a bit odd since catching is as straightforward as it can be, but I guess it makes sense. And Cerulean Cave has a new layout, a much stronger one, honestly, that actually requires a bit more work to navigate, which spans all three floors to reach Mewtwo. On the visual end, Pokemon sprites are an improvement in a lot of ways, with them being pretty perfect conversions of the official artwork, at least from the front. The back sprites are unchanged and leave a lot to be desired, but from the front end, things look a ton better, at least on a technical level. There is a charm to the really ugly sprites that Red and Blue have that the yellow ones kinda don't have, but a few trainers like Blaine also got overhauled, and there's some additional details. Cerulean's generic officer is made to look like Officer Jenny, while the Pokemon Center attendant is made more to look like Nurse Joy and has a Chansey, which are cute little details. Details. In every other aspect, it's pretty much unchanged. The overworld still looks pretty nice, the music is still nice, it just ain't a big improvement over red and blue outside of battle sprites, which are, to be fair, a lot less janky looking.
Manga time. First off, we return to Pokemon Special for the Yellow Chapter. Having burnt through the gyms in red and blue, the Yellow Chapter has to take a new spin, moving the Elite Four to the Antagonist role, which was a interesting choice. I'm not sure how much consultation they had with Game Freak, clearly some, given that the closer Yellow gets to the end, the more Gen 2 Pokemon get teased, but definitely bit them in the ass a bit with how they were able to utilize Lance later. Regardless, the new protagonist, Yellow, who was introduced at the end of Red and Blue, is cute. She works hard to protect not only her own Pokemon, but even wild Pokemon and opposing trainers' Pokemon. In battle, she'll never attack, and she'll only find ways to passively disable the opponent's Pokemon. Her complete ignorance of battling also helps her stand out from the very competent trio of the previous arc. Her healing and Pokemon mind reading abilities come off a bit bullshitty, but it suits her well and doesn't come off absurdly Mary Sue-ish. And I like the reveal that Lance has the same thing, although the further reveal that Giovanni does is weird. Not that I hate him coming back and giving a hand to the hero. Always a joy to have the villain hero team up thing for a bigger threat. Speaking of Lance and the others, I enjoy them enough. Lance is a well-humanized villain who believes that eliminating humanity will protect Pokemon, which is... Ridiculous and stupid, but it makes sense for him in the context of the story. Especially because eventually Yell's friendship with Pokemon shines through to him. Agatha and Lorelai are pretty one notes, just going along with Lance, but Bruno's pretty good too. He lives for battle and he's manipulated and controlled into joining the others because he's a bit dense, which makes his rivalry with Red pretty endearing. The Lugia finale is a bit ridiculous and comes off weird because Lugia is used as part of GSC's big finale as well, although I can't deny it's very cool visually and works thematically. And yeah, the art is nice too, of course. Fantastic and creative action, although the characters often go for the more chibi art style. I'd assume largely based on the artist's illness, making the more detailed drawings tough, but it does coincidentally suit Yellow as a character extremely well, given her softness and childlike nature. That all said, it's a cute arc. Not as strong as the two directly before and after, but like the game it's based on, it's a cute stopgap between major releases, despite its flaws. As for the Electric Tail Pikachu, I, uh, don't know. <laughs> It's a pretty loose adaptation of the anime, very in some ways, taking the concept of some episodes and tweaking them to fit the tone the manga goes for, which bounces between silly and tryhard. Honestly, it's pretty whatever. Ash as a character isn't horrible here. He starts out a bit too dumb, but ends up more competent than his anime counterparts. One thing I'm not a fan of at all is how all over the place the art is. Characters fall into very generic 90s style, but are frequently depicted in extremely inconsistent art. Meanwhile, the Pokemon are drawn in an uncanny, overly realistic style that makes them pretty off-putting to look at. Onyx, for example. But Pikachu especially is often depicted in bizarre ways, with over-the-top expressions that don't play well with the hyper-realism for humor in the way that Pocket Monsters attempted, but in a way that just just ends up looking a bit weird, sloppy. The manga is fairly short, but it lacks the positives that the anime has, like consistent art, time to develop the Pokemon of the week past what the games could do, and the whole thing kind of just feels like an odd novelty over an interesting book on its own. So yeah, I brought up the anime. Yellow pulls so much from the anime that I needed to a little, so I watched a little. As a kid I watched it pretty frequently, and in college I watched quite a bit too. Well, it was high. So I'm fairly familiar with the original series, and there's truthfully a lot that works. In these original few games, especially Red and Blue, you'd see a Pokemon only as a sprite and get two sentences about it in the Pokedex. The anime serves as a great companion to the game in that regard by allowing you to see Pokemon in good quality, get a feel for how they move and act, and how they should look, which is what really works. As the series drags on, you notice how repetitive and limited it is. Ash can never grow because there's no tension if he always wins, the rockets go from moderately threatening but goofy to complete clowns, while the early show feels much less compelled to always include them in major ways. I also like the look of the show, at least early on. It's fairly cheap TV animation, and even early on they would rely on can animations for Pikachu especially, but I think it's much less so at early points in the series, and the hand-drawn animation looks nice. Much, much more so than the later digital stuff, the current digital stuff. The music is also pretty noteworthy. The dub has fun music. Stupid music but fun. But even then, I really like the orchestrated flair for Team Rocket that gives them this kind of theatrical goofiness that really works for them. As for everyone else, I mean Ash is pretty insufferable, early in the series less so, because he's an inexperienced proxy for the viewer to learn about the world of Pokemon, but even then he comes off as intolerably stupid quite often. You know, M Misty is a character, Rock is the funny one most of the time. I like the Rockets before they become completely stupid. As for everyone else, I don't know. In conclusion, I mean, I think there's some good value in the original series. They often have pretty interesting ways to show off what makes each Pokemon cool and unique, and the Monster of the Week format is really good for a series like Pokemon. Especially before there was 3D games and spin-offs, higher quality anime specials, mobile games, internet fan art. It was a good way to get immersed into the world, although the series is apparently in a rough spot now and has been for a long time. I'm not gonna watch the new stuff, it looks awful. I'd say a few episodes of the Kano stuff is enjoyable, even selected at random since it tended to be pretty self-contained. 
As an adaptation, the anime is pretty loose, but Yellow in Return is kind of loose too. It borrows Jesse James and Meowth and stars Pikachu, but it's pretty clearly an awkward retrofitting in response to the anime's popularity. Alright, team time. Pikachu, which was suffering to use. Double team situationally let it get pretty strong. Tauros, Venomoth, Cloyster, Primeape, and Dodrio. Strategies are pretty light in this earlier Pokemon, so I think it's all pretty self-explanatory. Pikachu is the starter and does nothing but boost cheese at double team and spam Thunderbolt. Tauros is maybe the best Pokemon in the game besides Mewtwo. Uh, Snorlax gives a pretty big run for its money too. And Body Slam's very hard. Venomoth, can you tell I'm starting to struggle to find things I haven't used? It gets uh, Psychic and Sleep Powder. <laughs> Cloyster gets stabbed, Surf and Ice Beam. Primeape got me through Brock and hit decently well with Low Kick. And Dodrio is Super Fero. Drill Pack and Tri Attack are both great. There isn't much more to say. I'm working hard to keep making creative teams for Kanto, but options are becoming limited very fast. We'll see how I fare moving ahead, but I have some ideas at least. Yellow is an odd one to conclude on. Largely, it's the same good game as Red and Blue, and in a lot of ways, it's stronger. The three starters all being available, the testing of the friendship system, and general improvements to the sprites. There's a lot of good mixed in with a lot of weird. The rocket battles are somehow less interesting than the generic grunts they replace. Pikachu is pretty stagnant through the game and miserable to use, but the game is a lot less interesting if you ditch him, and the abundance of weird 1% stuff offsets some of the interesting route changes. I don't think it's awful. In fact, I wish it could have become the standard and that third versions copied the formula. Perhaps Togepi could have been the starter for Gen 2, like Ralts for Gen 3. I don't know. Preferably they could evolve because Pikachu does not cut it, but it certainly stands out from its basis much better than games like Crystal do, and could have made the third games feel a lot more different than they ended up being in reality. It's an interesting concept that I would have liked to see them take another swing at, but it's held back by some awkward execution basically. I'd say it's generally a slightly worse experience than Red and Blue, despite the improvements, but it's still a solid choice, especially if you want something a bit different. Pokemon Red and Green aren't actually all that fascinating to talk about in the context of this video. Released in 1996, these versions of the game served as the basis for the franchise and are near identical to Red and Blue, but with a few additional bugs, largely made interesting solely off the Japanese exclusive third version I'll get to soon. For most players, Red and Green are functionally identical to Red and Blue outside of being in a language I assume most of my audience can't read. The version exclusives match Red and Blue, with Green lining up with Blue, and the only major difference the average person would notice is that the battle sprites are, somehow, even worse than Red and Blue. Charmingly so, I suppose, but man, Venusaur, what did they do to you? It's also worth noting that a handful of attack animations were changed, primarily ones like Thunder, which flashed the screen pretty quickly and harshly, leading to the animations being softened in later releases to reduce health risks. Beyond that, the games have a handful of their own glitches. You can get softlock by the catching tutorial if you manage to fill your box before doing it, and a different softlock from evolving your starter before getting the Pokedex. Swift can be forced to miss due to having 100 accuracy instead of bypassing accuracy checks, and if you lose to Sabrina, you still get the badge, which is funny. But it's all pretty minor stuff that would be fixed before the game reached the last. Cerulean Cable also has a unique layout in these games, not as easy as Red and Blue's layout where you can just bypass the top floor entirely, but not as strong as Yellow's. You need to go through all three floors, but it feels a bit more trial and error to go up and down in the right spots, which is kind of lame. You may be asking, why am I discussing these games? Um, well, I, I played them to set up for something more interesting. Unless you speak Japanese or are learning it, the value in Red and Green is pretty low. You get the same experience as playing Red and Blue, so just play those, but we have one more, way more interesting game to play that requires a bit of trading from Red and Green to complete. The lost original third version of Generation 1, then we can finally get a bit more modern. Oh, teams, right. Red. Charizard does what it always does. Machamp, hardy physical attacker, but without fighting moves, it's a bit gimped. Dugtrio, it's fast and uses Slash and Earthquake. Zapdos, Thunderbolt, Drill Peck, and Fly on the Overworld. Starmie, on top of the usual Surf and Psychic, it got some unique coverage with Ice Beam and Thunder. Basically an anti-Lance machine, and Vileplume did status for catching, but not a whole lot else. As for Green, Venusaur is a starter, Razor Leaf and Leech Seed. I originally planned on doing the Toxic Leech Seed strategy, but kind of pivoted into boosting every stat with growth. Vaporeon was a Surf and Ice Beam guy, with Acid Armor for boosting. Persian slashed really hard, I really enjoyed Persian actually. Articuno was the Flyer, but also Ice Beam and Blizzard. Marowak was the Slow Earthquaker, and lastly Chansey was slow, but it's huge special that it used pretty much anything well, although it was largely the dedicated Psychic user. As I've said, making interesting teams isn't easy, things are pretty limited in their use, and I'm running a bit sparse on options at this point. the main 
Online series has ever had, something of a lost version of the game locked to Japan. Released in 1996, Blue was initially a mail-order only game, available through Koro, Koro Magazine. Yeah, in order to get this game, you'd have to mail cash to a magazine. Until 1999, when Blue had a brief retail run, and more recently, it has been released on the 3DS Virtual Console, in Japan only, because, of course. Blue is a fairly minor adjustment of red and green. It fixed some of that version's bugs, it largely improved battle sprites, and due to this, served as the basis for the international red and blue, being divided into two, with red and green's differences being applied back to it. It's a weird amount of effort on the localization team's part to gut the game we never got in order to split it back into two, but what can you do? Beyond fixing sprites and bugs, what's changed? Not much, honestly. Unlike Yellow, this lost third version doesn't feature any storyline changes, trainers don't have new teams or moves, the changes are rather subtle, consisting entirely of slight changes to where and when things are found. To jump to exclusions really quickly, the game somewhat obnoxiously overlaps all of its exclusions with exclusives from Red and Green, meaning it requires both, and even if you had Yellow, you'd still need Red and Green. The exclude Pokémon are Ekans and Arbok solely from Red, Vulpix and Ninetales from either Green or Yellow, Mankey and Primeape from Red or Yellow, Bellsprout, Weeping Bell, and Victory Bell from Green or Yellow, Electabuzz from Red, and Magmar from Green. Besides missing both Magmar and Electabuzz, again, Blue gets one or the other of every version exclusive while missing the other, and like Yellow gets both Pinsir and Scyther. Moving on to things that are in the game, I think the changed in-game trades are the most interesting things. Pokemon that were trade exclusive in Ren Green, like like Tongue and Jinx, have moved to the wild, in the Safari Zone and in the Seafoam Islands respectively, although Mr. Mime is still trade only, through every version, poor guy. There's a handful of neat stuff in the trades. The useless Nidoran trade in the underground path between Cerulean and Vermilion is swapped for one for a Poliwag, giving you access to a water type that isn't Blastoise or Gyarados well before the Super Rod is ever obtained, even if the next two gyms are pretty horrible for it. The game features not one, like Yellow, but two trade evolutions available in-game. Gengar and Golem, which can be traded for using the other two Pokémon that evolved by trade, Machoke and Kadabra, serving to hint at all four available trade evolutions. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, though. The game has some trade exclusives of its own, Kangaskhan and Tauros. Their exclusion makes the Safari Zone a touch easier if you're trying to complete that, but also makes them more limited inherently due to requiring fairly steep tributes of Rhydon and Persian. Beyond that, lots of minor changes occur throughout the game. Ditto is available in Rock Tunnel, which substantially increases the chances that some poor Japanese kid was tricked into using it. Rapidash is in Cerulean Cave, which has the same layout as the American Red and Blue to save on grinding it up. Dragonair is available at level 30 in the game corner, sharply mitigating the awful Dragonite game in exchange for eating up all your money, and some more minor stuff. It's pretty fascinating, but unless you know the base game very well, you're likely not going to notice a lot of these differences because they're kind of spread out and they're kind of minor. But graphically, you can refer to the Red and Blue section. The game served as the basis for those. They look identical. Okay, so my team got a bit disrupted by an odd event. My team is initially Blastoise, who does the usual, Jinx, a solid psychic and ice user, Wigglytuff, which is a discount Clefable, Alakazam, the psychic spam machine, Aerodactyl, a big but limited physical hitter and flyer, and Butterfree for its utility and powder moves. But I had a bit of wrench thrown in this plan by getting a blind shiny horsey. I accidentally killed the first horsey I fished up, caught the second, and its stats lined up with what would make it shiny. It's such an odd novelty that I had to use it and replace Butterfree, which effectively made Seizure a less good second Blastoise that I had to put a lot of work into catching up. Should I have done this for a shiny I couldn't see? No. Uh, but after this, I was able to clone it into silver. I couldn't trade up to silver because you can't trade between English and Japanese Gen 1 and 2 games. Uh, and then I evolved into Kingdra over in that game, so that was neat. While I was doing so, I also found out that my odd egg Elkid was shiny, so I missed out on using that. Elkid has a bad shiny. Blue is an oddity. It's so similar to red and green that it feels pointless to play unless you really need a mix-up. But the language barrier is a huge obstacle in actually going through it, too. I like the changes, the trades are cool especially, and I got extremely lucky during it, but it's so similar to the base games that unlike yellow, it's not even really a big shake-up, just a mild curiosity. Okay, now to wrap up all Generation 1, kind of quickly, because I kind of already wrapped it up like four times. I was kind of surprised to be honest, it's been ages since I returned to these original games and they really do hold up. My largest worry was the speed of the games, and the walking speed is slow, but the games are really so well designed you never notice. The way Kanto folds in on itself keeps the pace up, the battles are snappy, and best of all, the way the world is navigated just feels good. It's not as puzzle heavy as some of the later games, but moving on requires exploring to find solutions, whether it's buying drinks, exploring the safari, exploring weird non-traditional dungeons like a Yakuza base under a casino, a graveyard tower. Kanto feels like a real flesh out world and is the best part of the game. There's a lot of problems too. There's a lot, I've talked about them. The PC is a disaster without the move option. If you want to organize shit, oh, fucking hell. 
Pokemon are the least interesting they'll ever be to use. Level up movesets are mostly abysmal and you have to rely on single use TMs to make anything usable, which is kind of frustrating because if you change your mind, you've already sunk fallacy costed your way into fucking using Ice Beam on a crappy thing you're never going to touch again. Like you have to hold on to all your TMs until the late game and plan your team out way ahead of time. Uh, never mind the lack of interesting options for like setup or strategy because there's no weather or anything interesting. At best you get Swords Dance, but usually you'll just be scrounging together whatever stab you have and of course there's those back sprites. Regardless of all that, I don't know. It's not the best the series has to offer, but despite the age of the game, Gen 1 is very, very playable. Kanto's a bit boring, but it's good boring. It's real. It's... It's real. It's fun to explore. It's our world, but just a little bit better. It's the star of the show more so than the actual gameplay, but just this one time, it's pretty enjoyable to go through. That's about all I have for now. A video on Fire Red and Leaf Green will be out soon. Hopefully. Thanks for watching, and um... Yeah.